One, two, three. One, two, three. I will tell her. Yeah. Is my hair okay? It was like in the wind before I came. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here. Uh, oh, this is the live streaming. The link. Uh, the yeah. live streaming link starts. Uh, on the website. Yeah, on the website. Yeah, on the website. So, good morning, everybody. So, it's very nice to see all of you, despite the weather stormy weather, so thank you for coming uh, to the Expo Symposium. I'm Janja Daj Suring, Program Director of the Epirian Software Technology Program, so I uh, welcome you all to join the Expo Symposium today. This is our first symposium to be in person since the corona started, so we are very excited to have you all. But we have also live streaming, so people at home, or you can tell the dear ones to see it online, we are tu.nl software technology slash software technology. So it's being live streamed. So um, today I'm going to, we are going to have uh, two parts, Expo Symposium, uh, the first part where a set of our graduates are going to present the results of their final projects. And then afternoon we have graduation ceremony uh, that is chaired by our scientific director, Mark van den Brand. And uh, I will be chairing the uh, symposium now and uh, officially, we welcome Mark van den Brandt to open the ceremony. Okay, Professor Mark van den Brandt, Scientific Director of PDNGST Program. Thank you. Um, let me first introduce myself. I'm uh, Mark van den Brandt. I'm uh, Scientific Director of the, PD, of the PDN Program Software Technology. And I'm also Graduate Program Director of the Computer Science and Engineering Program. And in my normal life, if time allows, I'm a full professor of software engineering and technology. The PDN program. Um, as you all know, um, after your master program, you can actually choose two tracks. Actually, you can actually do three things. It, it shows only two. Uh, of course, the one thing that is not shown on this uh, page or on this slide is that you can go directly to industry. But for people who want to learn more, educate themselves further, there are two possibilities. One is a PhD, four years, and the other one is PDN, which is a two years program and which focuses actually on um, designing, developing, architecting. So, creating things. Whereas in the, in the PhD, you are actually educated as a researcher, and at the end of the defense, there's always a committee meeting, and in the committee meeting, it's always asked, okay, uh, was the candidate a independent researcher? And if that is answered by yes, then the candidate always gets his PhD. And in the meetings that I chair, uh, at, the, at the defense of a PDN, 
That's also one of the questions that I always ask. Is the PDN actually, has, he, has the candidate shown to be an independent designer? And if, that's the, if the supervisors say yes, he has really shown to be on top of it technically, but also in, in making the design decisions, then, I th then it is obvious that the, the candidate should de deserve the title of PDN. So how is the program organized? It's a 14-month training program with courses, very intensive courses, but also in-house industrial projects. So these are projects where a group of trainees actually goes to a company uh, and works on a certain problem, or here at the TUE, given a problem of the company, works on, on a solution. After these 14 months, the trainee goes into industry and does a 10-month project where he or she shows uh, the designer skills. So everything that he or she has learned over the 14 months is actually being shown in this, this 10-month design project. And at the end of this, this 10 months, um, a thesis or report is produced the report is being evaluated, and then the degree is uh, handed out. What do we do as software technology? We, we offer actually a broad range of topics, but they are all, as the title of the project actually indicates, they are all focused on software, on software developing, on software maintaining, etc. So, we, we look at the software aspect, but of course software is never there in isolation. It's not that we just create a piece of software, and especially in this region, in this high-tech region that we are working and, and doing uh, education and researching, we always have to deal with the systems around the software, or the software in the systems. So it's actually important that we look into the system architecture and system design of software intensive systems, and especially, let's say, the machines of, of ASML, Vanderlande, Canon, um, Thermo Fisher. They, they are high tech systems, complex, in which software plays an important role. And it is also important that there are multiple angles from which you have to address the problem. As I said, the software is not in isolation, but has to, to, is a kind of glue that brings everything together. So, as a software engineer, and especially as a PDN trainee, you have to be aware and you have to work together with other disciplines to create the software. If we look at what we have done so far, in our program, we have had 506 graduates so far. And this year we have 36 trainees, including the trainees starting in uh, 2021. So the trainee of last year, Robin Mennens, um, was nominated for the uh, best um, software technology award. And last uh, um, Friday, the TUE awards were handed out. Um, unfortunately, Robin was not one of the, um, no, he was nominated, but he didn't get the, 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 the P, best PDN award of the TUE. But nevertheless, it's a very good achievement that he was uh, awarded of nominated for the best software technology award. He did his job with Philips Healthcare and he worked on the Philips Remote AI streaming platform, Praise, where different data sources are brought together in, in order to actually help medical people to take better uh, decisions. So, this year we will again nominate a candidate um, that will happen within a few weeks from now. We will form a committee. Uh, we will look at all the reports that are being produced. 
and we will select one of we will select three of them they go to the committee and the committee eventually takes the decision on which they consider the best software technology uh, PDN thesis of this year I'm not going to read out all the names because I have to do this this afternoon also but this is the generation of 2019 that today is going to receive their uh, degree. It was a pleasure to work with them. Um, I give a small part in, in, in the program. I give a, 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 a workshop on, so, on uh, model-driven development together with Eugen Schindler. Um, and I always like to do this because it, 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 it is different working with a group of, of 20 people and educating them than standing in front of 60 or 80 students, master students, and trying to get their attention because these 20 people are really motivated to learn something. Um, as, as a um, member of this, this management team of the PDN program, software technology, I always like to supervise also a number of trainees. And this year, I had the opportunity to supervise Gorge, and I had the opportunity to supervise Christopher. And I really enjoyed working with them um, and, and to see how they have grown in the 10 months. And I think that all the supervisors observe that the trainees that start somewhere in January are completely different when they graduate in, in October. They go very, through a very street, steep learning path. 18 trainees that started, coming from 13 nationalities, and again, we are very proud that about 22% of the trainees are female. A few words on the projects, the in-house projects that we did this year. Um, so, what we observe is that data is getting more important. This was also what I observed last Friday with the uh, award ceremony. There were nine nominees, and I think seven of the projects, seven of the nominees had AI in the title. So AI is a very important aspect also in what we are doing, and that's also what we observe in the final project. Most of, most of these projects have a data or AI component in it. And that also holds for the in-house project. So we did the project with both security, with CERN, Switzerland, and with the European Space Agency. And there were also a number of multidisciplinary projects where we actually worked not, as, not only with the software technology trainees, but also with the trainees from MSD and ASD. So this is also a PDN program on automotive system design and megatronic system design. So that's where we bring together. So there we did projects with Valeo, Pixel Farming Robotics, TNO, and again Valeo. So this brings me to the end of the opening. It took me one more minute than, than I expected. I wish you today a very fruitful and inspiring morning. I will be back here this afternoon. Unfortunately, my agenda does not allow me to be here the whole morning. Um, I will see you this afternoon with the graduation ceremony and um, yeah, enjoy the inspiring presentations of the trainees of this morning. Okay, thank you, Mark. So, George is the first speaker. And I think I tell the speakers, please stay either behind the table or under the lights for the purpose of the lighting of the live streaming. And we have now three uh, set of uh, presentations, one from ASML, one from Rabobank and Philips. Since we don't have much time, we'll uh, welcome the speaker directly. First speaker is George Aziz. He has done his project at ASML. Yes.
So, good morning, everyone, and welcome to my presentation on armoring formal components against foreign behavior. My name is George Aziz, and for the past two years, I was a software technology PDA trainee here at the UE. Today, I'm going to present to you the work of the last 10 months, the work of my thesis. And even though this was an individual project, this was by no means an individual effort. There were a lot of people involved in this project, the most important of which is the project steering group. The project steering group consists of Nondas Rodoyanis, Ivo Der Horst, Dr. Tim Willemsen, and Sven Weber. Their contributions to this project were key for its successful completion. So, today, I'm going to give you enough information from the project context. This will allow me to define the project scope. Then we will discuss about robust software integration of two different types of systems. Then we will continue with the project management plan. And finally, with the conclusions, recommendations, and of course, some time for questions. The project context. A very interesting question is how can we transform a set of wafers, a set of silicon wafers, to one of these fancy chips which are integrated to our everyday life? And the answer to this question is via the chip manufacturing process. This, is, uh, this process has several steps, and once we repeat it enough times for one wafers and we stack them on top of each other, then we can have one of these fancy chips. The most critical step of this process is the exposure. And the exposure is facilitated by machines which are implemented here at ASML. And these machines are very complex, very complex. They contain more than 50 million lines of code. And one of their key attributes is the wrap time. Now you can imagine when something crashes, like an application of your phone, you get annoyed. Well, if this machine crashes, it's also very expensive. It's, it, its crashes, they cost thousands of, of euros for the factory. And this is because the complete factory has to remain idle until they restart. So now the question was, how does ASML approach this? How does ASML minimize the risk of software crashes for these machines? And the answer is formal software engineering. ASML adopted formal software engineering, which is a methodology that allows us to implement bug-free software. Conventional uh, formal software engineering enables the development of software and we can, define the, we can define the allowed behavior at all times. Also, it uses automatic mathematical analysis to prove two things. First, only the allowed behavior is ever going to be invoked. And secondly, the, abs the absence of bugs, such as deadlocks and live locks, which are some otherwise impossible to prove. And this is all good. However, the integration between conventional and formal, formally implemented software is inevitable. And for conventional software, well, we have no explicit definition of the allowed behavior. We have no guarantees that the allowed behavior is ever going to be invoked. And as a result, when disallowed behavior is invoked, we have crashes and we have bugs. And this is something completely undesirable. So, in a way, when we integrate these two systems, the conventional software, the legacy software, corrupts the formal software by invoking this disallowed or unforeseen behavior. And for this project, the goal is to explore robust integration strategies between these two types of systems. But before we continue, let's take a look at the components of this integration at the building blocks. The building blocks of this integration are software components. They contain an interface and an implementation. They also encapsulate a set of services in the form of function calls and events. And they communicate with other software components based on the client-server communication model. And as mentioned before, we have different types of components. We have formal components that consist of a formal interface and a formal implementation. And the formal interface this is where it contains the explicit definition, the formal definition of the allowed behavior. And this is described in state machines. 
We also have the formal implementations, which are developed with explicit guarantees for interface adherence. But what does this mean? Well, this means, in this example that we have here, that the formal implementation will always invoke allowed behavior on the interface that it uses, and that it implements the interface that it provides in a correct way. However, they are also being developed with explicit assumptions that they will be used in a correct way. And again, what does this mean? On here, with our example, the formal implementation is developed with the assumption that when a different software uses this implementation via the interface, it again will invoke only the allowed behavior. But as mentioned before, we also have legacy components. They contain legacy interfaces and legacy implementations. And we have the specification of the component somewhere else, maybe in a Word document. And here we see that we don't have a concrete connection between the software, the code, and the specification. The legacy interface, they lack a formal definition of the allowed behavior. And we have the legacy implementations, which are developed without any guarantees for specification adherence. And also, we don't have any reasoning for the behavior at all. And now, let's try to visualize the integration of these two components, of these two types of components. Let us assume that we have this hierarchical structure of formal, for formal components, which we are going to call our formal stack. And these formal components, they require a set of services, here at the bottom. But let's assume that these services, they are provided by legacy components. Our formal stack here, also, provi also provides a set of services via the top-level interface. And again, let's assume that a legacy component wants to use these services. Here, in this picture, we have a clear distinction between the two technology spaces. In the middle, we have the formal technology space, where we have interface adherence, mathematical proven properties, and on the top and bottom, we have the legacy technology spaces, where we don't have mathematical reasoning for what is going on there. In this project, what we need to do is find out a robust integration strategy between these two types of systems. And this gives us enough information to define the project scope. During this, pro this project, we explore robust integration strategies between conventional and formally implemented systems. And they need to do two things. The first thing is to protect the formal system from disallowed behavior. And the second thing, to connect the two technology spaces. Once we have that in place, then we can transition to the next part of the project, which is to design and implement a working prototype for the automatic generation of the solution direction for the software environment of ASML. So all in all, this project is about robust software integration. And we can start with the solution direction. Here, we have a very simple example with a formal implementation that provides one interface, and it requires one interface as well. The first thing that we need to do is armor the formal implementation, so protect the formal implementation against disallowed behavior. In order to do that, we introduce both to the client and to the server side the anti-corruption layer. And the second thing that we need to do is connect the two technology spaces. Connect the legacy technology space with the formal technology space. And this is achieved by introducing the glue code layers, both on the client and on the server side. We also identified the anti-corruption requirements, which must be satisfied by the anti-corruption layer, and the integration requirements, which must be satisfied by the glue code layer. And we can start with the first concern. So, how do we protect the formal system? When we have a formal system, we have incoming and outgoing behavior, both on the client and on the server side. And when we integrate our formal system with legacy software, we need to protect it via income from the incoming behavior. This means that on the client side, we need to protect the formal system from incoming function calls. And again, this is achieved by the anti-corruption layer, which keeps track of the system state, and it propagates only the allowed behavior. On the server side, we need to flip our reasoning. Here, we need to protect our formal system from incoming events. And again, this is facilitated by the anti-corruption layer. 
it keeps track of the system state and it propagates only the allowed behavior. We also identified the design rules for the realization of these anti-corruption layers and we validated that uh, when these rules are followed, the anti-corruption requirements are satisfied. And now, we need to connect also the two technology spaces. And as mentioned before, this is achieved by the glue code layer. The glue code layer needs to do two things. First, subscribe and unsubscribe to events of the server, and then uh, proxy behavior between the two components, between the two systems. Let's take, for example, the client side. In this case, the glue code layer needs to subscribe and unsubscribe to events which are raised by the formal system. And the second concern that it must address is adapt the behavior invoked by the one system to the behavior which is expected by the other system. We also provided a design for the realization of the glue code layer, and we validated that with this design, the, interaction, the integration requirements are satisfied. And this summarizes the exploration of this project. So let's see the results. First, we identified anti-patterns both on the client and server-side interfaces of our formal system. For this, we provided guidelines to design armorable formal systems, and we gave these guidelines to the developers. We identified corner cases which had potential hazards for the formal system, and we provided solutions for those corner cases as well. Moreover, we provided a design to create these, the correct by design anti-corruption layers that fully protect the formal system. And finally, we also provided a correct by design approach in order to realize the glue code layer that connects the formal and the legacy technology spaces. And this allowed us to continue to the second part of the project. And the idea here is that if this is developed by engineers, by ASML engineers, and we also have the legacy systems which are developed by ASML engineers, would it be possible to generate everything else? So is it possible to actually generate the anti-corruption and the glue code layers? And here, the idea, again, is that given two interfaces, given a legacy and a formal interface, could we develop an anti-corruption generator that would provide us the anti-corruption layer and an integration generator that would provide us the glue code layer. For this, we used the Eclipse modeling framework, and for the anti-corruption layer, we used model-to-model -model transformation techniques, and for the glue code layer, model-to-text transformation techniques. The current assumption of the, two, of the tool is that the two interfaces, the formal and the legacy interface, must contain symbols that fully match. Now, for the verification, of the anti-corruption generator, we developed a test suite, and this test suite verifies that the generated artifacts satisfy the anti-corruption anti -corruption requirements, and we also used ASML production models for the validation of the tool. This means that we took the models, we generated anti-corruption layers, and we saw that the anti-corruption requirements are still satisfied. Now, for the integration generator, again, for the validation, we developed a test suite, and it does exactly the same thing. It verifies that the generated artifacts satisfy the integration requirements. And finally, ASM company experts from ASML, they reviewed and validated the generated artifacts as well. As for the summary, the anti-corruption generator supports both the client and the server side. The glue code generator, the integration generator supports the glue code layer for the server side, and we had to discope the glue code layer for the client side due to time limitations and prioritization. Now, up to this point, we saw what I did at this project. We can transition to how. And as with every project, the first step that we need to take is identify the deliverables and do a prioritization of these deliverables according to the stakeholders' needs. In this particular project, we saw that the deliverables were complex enough, they couldn't be developed in one go, so we decided to introduce several iterations of these deliverables. We saw the features that we wanted to support, we made a sensible grouping of these features, and we introduced iterations and milestones for them. 
At this point, I'm going to present to you the very high-level overview of the project management plan. The first phase of the project, which took two months, January and February, was the familiarization phase. I had to familiarize myself with the formal development technologies, the engineering technologies, and of course, the software environment of ASML. The next four months were devoted to the development of the anti-corruption generator. The first, the first iteration, April and March, it focused on more basic features and it laid down the groundwork for the anti-corruption generator, whereas the second iteration, it enriched the tool with more advanced features. The next month, July, was devoted fully on documentation, and August and September were devoted on documentation and the development of the integration generator. And finally, now at October, it's the wrap-up of the project. So let's continue with the conclusions and some recommendations for future work. Armoring formal systems is feasible. We provided guidelines such that we can design armorable formal systems, and we also provided rules in order to create artifacts that fully protect our formal implementation. Generating anti-corruption and glucose layers, again, is feasible. We developed the anti-corruption generator, which, can, uh, which we validated using ASML production model, and we also developed the integration generator, but currently supports only the, ser the server side. With these tools, we can reduce the development time of the anti-corruption layers and the glucose layers from hours to seconds, but we also saw that the integration generator should be extended in order to support mismatches between the interfaces as well. So the current, the, car, uh, the tool should omit the current assumption that it has. And as for future work, the recommendations with respect to the anti-corruption generator are to industrialize the tool, and with respect to the integration generator, are first to extend it such that it supports the client-side integration variant, variant as well, and secondly, to also extend it in order to support symbolic and or behavioral mismatches between the interfaces. Well, this was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And now we have some time for questions. Thank you, George. So, any questions? So while some of you are thinking about questions, <laughs> uh, maybe. So uh, you have shown uh, the how. Eh? So mm -hmm. um, unlike uh, PhDs, as you all know, in the PDM program, we also focus on the process. So our trainees also become the project managers of their 10-month project. And it's not easy because it's very ambiguous, ill-defined um, project with broad scope. And sometimes you have to change the direction. It sounds very easy when uh, George has presented the stages and since some junior trainees are in attendance who are going to do the final project next year. Do you have any um, aha moments in your process when you were carrying out the project? Well, the a surprising moment for me was that you cannot develop everything and you have to be very explicit on what you can deliver and what you cannot deliver. And... Uh, yeah, have your arguments in place and communicate this early with your stakeholders. This is paramount and it's going to be appreciated because everyone will be on the same page. Yeah, this is the way to go in my opinion. This was the surprising moment for me. Okay. Thank you. Han has a question. Your question was, if I had a lot of what? Waste. Waste. Waste of time? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. This project was an exploration project. We saw that, uh, in theory, some things are feasible, and uh, when you try to do them, when you develop them by hand, this is very feasible and a very nice idea. But, uh, yes, uh, also some things cannot be generated. So you try, you try and try and try, but at some point you need to draw the line and say that, okay, this is enough, we cannot do this. So 
this code goes to waste. For me, yes. Ah, no, not something like this. Better because yeah. 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 So you have Perfect. interfaces on top and uh, at the bottom uh, there. In my experience, um, the most difficult part in software engineering is defining interfaces. If you have proper interfaces, it reduces to a mathematical problem, and we know how to solve that uh, there. Um, but um, most issues uh, and defects we have is that we didn't uh, find, um, uh, you could not define uh, the right, uh, define the right um, uh, interfaces uh, there. Uh, that means that you have to change that, and especially for legacy software, uh, you don't have clear interface mm -hmm. specs there, etc. Uh, so, to what extent does this really help uh, in solving the biggest problem in software engineering? To what extent does? Does this help? Uh, to make this uh, formal methods uh, there, because no. you look at a, a certain quite isolated problem uh, there, uh, um, assuming that you can define good interfaces, uh, but we have mm -hmm. uh, still the problem is in defining the interfaces. And I apologize, uh, it is very provocatively phrased uh, now. No, no, it's all right. Uh, yeah. uh, well, I will first answer uh, to your question. Formal software engineering allows you to define more interfaces which are better. You have explicit definition of the behavior, so you have to think about your interfaces more. This is going to help uh, with that. But with your legacy interfaces, you cannot do something about this. With respect to that, we also saw that if you don't define your, interface, your interfaces well enough, then you have anti-patterns. But I cannot go into that because this is proprietary to ASML. Uh, although this was not part, defining the interfaces was not part of my project. I had to work with the interfaces that I got and generate, protect these in the implementation that provides these interfaces. Okay, so I like your answer because what you say is the application of formal methods, the, the biggest value is in uh, forcing people to define better interfaces. Exactly, yeah. exactly. No, I buy that argument. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Otherwise, we are going to welcome the next speaker. Thank you, George. Thank you. Next speaker is Jorge Cordero Cruz. He has done his project at uh, Rabobank. And usually, um, our projects are highly uh, engineering, design oriented projects from high tech industry, but Rabobank, the banks are having also quite interesting design and AI related challenges. This is uh, one of those projects you'll see. Hi. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Good morning uh, for the ones here. Good uh, afternoon, evening for the ones watching the live stream also, perhaps. Good morning. My name is Jorge Cordero, and now I'm going to talk to you about what I did in the last 10 months uh, for Rabobank for my final graduation PDN project. So uh, this is the agenda. What I'm going to do is uh, talk to you first about uh, the sponsors. Then I will uh, introduce the context, a little bit about the problem analysis. Uh, then I will go into the solution architecture, the prototype, uh, the results, and, uh, well, conclusions. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can always be uh, free to ask. So, uh, important, very important, this project wouldn't be done without uh, our sponsors. First, uh, what is Rabobank? Well, Rabobank is a cooperative of Deutsche Bank that was funded more than 100 years ago. The intention was to uh, uh, help to bank the unbanked farmers at that point in time. There were some farmers that nobody wanted to uh, finance, and Rabobank decided, well, let's create this uh, cooperative Dutch bank and let's uh, finance these farmers. And in the spirit of continuing uh, making the world a better place and financing uh, more farmers and working in agriculture, Rabobank nowadays is working with organizations that focus on agri agriculture. And also, it has created an innovation project that aims to help uh, smallholder farmers have access to finance. 
Now, uh, about the PDN uh, software technology. Well, you already uh, know what the PDN software technology is. Here I'm just uh, showing you uh, my colleagues who I'm very proud of. And uh, basically, in the PDN software uh, technology, I got uh, education and counseling support by my teachers and also by my supervisors. So together with my supervisors and uh, with Rabobank, I was able to conduct this uh, project. But what is this project about? Why are we here? So currently, nowadays, we have access to finance. But there are some parts in the world, uh, possibly uh, developing countries, where uh, smallholder farmers who are trying to produce uh, their crops and well, make a living and also help uh, feed uh, people like us. They uh, need to uh, have access to finance, but they do not have uh, this, this access to financial products. Why? Well, because they do, not have, uh, they do not have credit history records. So they, they, they have never have uh, access to a bank. Now they want to go to a bank to ask for a loan, to get some money, to uh, produce and sell their crops, but they cannot do that. And on the other side, we have uh, credit providers. These are uh, organizations, people who have the money and want to finance these uh, farmers, but they cannot do that. Why? Well, they need uh, these credit history records in order to do their uh, evaluation whether or not these farmers uh, can get this money. And in between, there is a disconnection there. And an innovation project at Rabobank wants to help the credit uh, providers connect with the smallholder farmers so that, well, more people can get finance and more food can be produced. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what uh, this innovation project uh, proposes. Before, uh, no credit history records. Uh, by default, no loans uh, are approved. But uh, with this idea, this uh, innovation project, what we have is uh, if a farmer doesn't have credit history records, perhaps we can uh, have uh, access uh, to information from satellites or personal information or information that comes from the internet. And we can evaluate whether this farmer uh, has uh, enough means to pay back this loan. So this is just an oversimplification of what the process is. But uh, let's think that uh, we have access to satellite data and then we can see the quality of the, the soil and the weather of certain farm and what the price of a, of a crop is during a certain year. And then we can evaluate uh, whether or not this farmer in a given uh, time will produce enough uh, crops to sell them in the market to pay back the loan. So with this information, we can generate a credit score and that, cre that credit score can be passed to the credit providers who can make a better informed decision. This doesn't mean that the credit providers will uh, reject or accept uh, the loan. This means that now they have more information to assess whether these farmers can get uh, a loan before this was not possible. So this is from the side of Rabobank, this credit scoring application that has been done. But, but uh, this is not from my side. I, I'm just doing a small contribution to this project. Uh, so. We have uh, this uh, alternative data that is not financial data. As I mentioned, this can be information from the uh, quality of the crops, can be information about the, the health of, or the age of the farmers, can be information about the quality of, of the farms, the weather in the past years, the, uh, also the price of the crops. Uh, if we take this uh, alternative data and we pass it to an analytic model, which can be a machine learning model or artificial intelligence model or a simple rule-based model, then we can generate this credit score, which in a very simplified way is just saying uh, to the credit providers, uh, how likely is that this uh, farmer will pay back? This is just an oversimplification. It's not exactly what it means, but just for the purpose of this uh, presentation, uh, let's think about it like that. So we can have our input data, goes to a model, generates a credit score. But uh, we do not have only one model. Perhaps we have uh, credit providers that work in South America and produce certain type of crop, and they will need a specific models because they, they have access to certain kind of data. And perhaps, uh, well, uh, credit providers in Africa or in Asia require a different type of model. So here now we have uh, that we can uh, create, or the data scientists at Rabobank can create uh, several different types of models for the credit providers, perhaps tens or perhaps hundreds of them, and we have to consider all of this uh, in the solution that we are going uh, to propose. So now, uh, we have these uh, credit uh, scores that can be generated, and we have these data scientists working on these models. And uh, during the training and creation of the model, uh, we can evaluate that this uh, intel uh, 
analytic models generate the predictions that we want. We have a set of training data. We know that pretty well how uh, this uh, data uh, works. And then we also generate a model that uh, provides the credit scores that we want. So what we have is the, the happy face. We have uh, accurate and not discriminatory predictions when we train. But uh, at the moment that we deploy these models and we use them with real data, which is going to change, then this uh, real data affects the predictions that are generated. Perhaps, the, perhaps we have uh, tropical uh, storms, or perhaps we have droughts for years, or perhaps uh, information is no longer available. So now our models will change uh, the predictions they generate. And perhaps they are no longer accurate uh, and unbiased. And what we want to do in production is we want to monitor that uh, these models are performing well. More importantly, we want to detect defects uh, or mistakes that happen in production. First, the data scientists generate models that generate uh, predictions according to our requirements. But when we deploy these models, what we actually want to know is whether these models still perform as expected. And now, this is finally the part where I was uh, involved. So the goal of my project. The goal of my project comes to a question. Can we monitor that the models are performing and generating credit scores with the quality that we want? So this is basically the question. Would be a simple question to answer because there are many uh, tools and techniques that we can use for machine learning and statistics and we can just apply it right away. But the challenge here is that we cannot verify that the credit scores that are generated have the qualities that we require. And why is this the case? Because we cannot compare the credit scores to a reference credit score. So what I mean is, at the moment the credit scores are generated, we do not know whether these credit scores are useful for the credit providers, because if the credit providers use these credit scores, then uh, the farmers uh, that get approved alone will start paying back their loan in maybe months or years, and after they finish paying back or they do not pay back, then we have information to say, well, these credit scores were useful or not. And by that point, well, we, do, uh, we already uh, spend too much time and perhaps our models are generated wrong information. So we want to know at the moment that they generate information, are they useful or not? So uh, taking this into consideration and also the concerns of our uh, stakeholders at, at Rabobank, uh, considering about monitoring these models, not about the whole uh, application, the whole credit score application, we can... Uh, we come up with a set of uh, business requirements that basically translate into three, four use cases, which are uh, we want to monitor uh, the predictions and the models. We want to generate alerts when things go uh, unexpected. We also want to be able to maintain the models, and we want to be able to deploy the models. As you can see, uh, the solution architecture that I proposed was able to achieve three of them. The, uh, the fourth one, alerting, was not possible due to uh, constraints on the data that we, we had in the uh, production environment and also time constraints, as uh, it always happens with these kind of projects. But uh, nonetheless, I created a solution architecture together, uh, well, with uh, my team. So this is the first uh, version of the solution architecture. The important part here is that uh, we are tackling, can we monitor our models? And for this, we have an element called monitoring engine that just has two types of tasks. Active uh, monitoring and passive monitoring tasks. A little bit more about that in, in a bit. But uh, there are also some other elements. Uh, for example, model development a component is just uh, modeling uh, how our data scientists will uh, train and create these models. Those, later, these models uh, go to the model registry, which is just a database storing these, these models so that later they can be analyzed and also they can be deployed into the application that used them to generate these credit scores. Uh, and there is the backend. Well, this is the, the application that is running uh, all the logic. And uh, we also have the prediction engine logger, logger. Well, this is just an element that stores all the predictions and input data so that eventually the monitoring engine can take these predictions, historical predictions, and input data, and also take the models for the model registry and run some analysis. Now, there are uh, certain uh, types of monitoring tasks I uh, designed, but I'm just going to show you one of them. And uh, this is... if. Let me, yeah, the, uh, an active monitoring uh, task. So here, what I'm trying to, to do is uh, answer this question. Do the models are affected 
by uh, changes in the input data. So let's pretend that we have uh, some set of uh, input data that uh, is about the weather, how much uh, a crop is produced, uh, the price of that crop in the market, and also the age of the farmer. So what we do now is we take this original input data, we modify it, and then we have our original and duplicated uh, and also altered uh, input data. So for each of these subsets, what we do is we use a model and generate the created scores. So now we have created scores for the original uh, input data and also for the modified input data. And now we, what we want to do is how different are there? This is the question we want to answer. Well, we can just uh, use a statistical test to check how similar they are. If they are similar, the model doesn't really care about the changes. So the model is uh, robust to changes, and that's fine because that's what we want in this case. If there are some changes, then the model is not robust, and maybe there is an area of opportunity there for our business uh, people at Rabobank, or we are violating a rule, a uh, financial rule, and then we have to take uh, action. So this, uh, so you can see it there, uh, this method doesn't tell us uh, something is wrong, something is right, it just tells us, okay, something is going on, there is a significant change, we have to pay attention to it. And then our data scientists will go there and take a look. So, uh, but this is not everything, because our data scientists are quite busy training hundreds of models. What about if we can uh, automate the validation tests that they uh, do? So they, they, there are some tasks that can be uh, automated. Perhaps we can work on that. So that's why we are introducing this uh, model deployment pipeline here in the second version, which uh, what has is a set of uh, monitoring uh, uh, deployment tests, which are just unit tests that check uh, specific conditions to uh, decide whether or not these models should be uh, uploaded to the uh, application. And uh, this is all fine and good, but uh, every time we generate a model, we have to make changes to the, uh, uh, to the code in the backend, to the code of the application. If we make changes to the application, we also have to make changes in the code, uh, in the code of the, the model. What if we don't have to do this? What if we separate the logic of the uh, code that implements, uh, the, implements and executes the model for the predictions and the rest of the, the uh, code of the logic of the application. So here you can see that the prediction engine was created to separate it from the backend. And now we can just deploy uh, models and we don't have to change the code. We can uh, change code. We don't have to modify the models unless there is a big uh, difference there, in which case we have to do it. Now, uh, this is all good and fine because we have a solution architecture, but does this actually work? Can we actually implement this? Are our uh, co-workers at Rabobank going to actually take a look at this and use it? Well, uh, to answer some of these questions, what I did was to take one of the, the code, uh, branches of the code base of the application and implement the solution architecture, which uh, we can see here, into the code base. So this is a, a small prototype. It's not production ready. We cannot just use it and deploy it, and then just uh, Rabobank can, can be happy about that. But uh, what we can do is uh, show to our uh, fellow uh, data engineers and data scientists, hey, my uh, solution architecture actually works. And if you want, you can continue working on this and make it production ready and get and reap the benefits of all our hard work in the last 10 months. And this is how it would look uh, on, the, on a web application. So what we have here is uh, we select the, the model that we want to monitor. Uh, what variables we want to monitor, how we want to modify these variables for checking how sensitive the model are. And then uh, we have to, to uh, figures here. Those, they don't look that good, but they are just to show uh, what we are doing. Uh, they are saying that, well, the model really doesn't care about the, the changes in the, in the predictions because nothing has significantly changed. And the age also doesn't appear to, to be that... Uh, Oh, actually, this one. The age appears to be a, a bit different, but the model uh, doesn't change about that, which is perfectly fine, because I'm not a data scientist who is going to say this is wrong or right. But, uh, but at least I know that this is happening. So in conclusion, uh, we have a solution architecture that uh, can help our data scientists to deploy their models and check some things that uh, when these models are deployed so that they, they don't fail uh, uh, with uh, easy mistakes that can be fixed. We also have a monitoring uh, component that can uh, provide a monitoring task for uh, our uh, input data and predictions and also our models. Uh, what's more, we have this prediction engine here that uh, help us to well, separate the logic from the, the, uh, 
from our models and the, the, the logic of the, the code that is actually running the, whole, the rest of the application. And uh, we have this model registry that helps us to keep track of all the models that have been uh, ever generated and deployed. And as future work, well, it would be nice to have more uh, tests that, that can be used to validate uh, other properties according to the requirements. As you can see, the requirements that were, that were uh, obtained uh, in the last uh, 10 months will not be all the requirements of this application. So in the future, more requirements might come. And then more tests will be required for the deployment pipeline. Uh, also, this uh, uh, model life cycle, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we have a database that stores the models. What if we implement some kind of logic that says, OK, we can actually activate, deactivate, update, degrade models in production according to these rules? Uh, this is something that was not completely explored, but it can be done. And uh, last but not least, the uh, crown, uh, well, well, the cherry on the top, is that it uh, would be nice to have an alert system uh, that indicates when something is going really, really wrong and someone has to take immediate measure. We have a monitoring system that is, can show us, well, something is going wrong or something is going really, really wrong. But what good is that if it's not sending emails to wake up people at 2 a.m. in the morning? Right? And uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Jorge. So, are there any questions? Uh, you work with a lot of data with other, from other people, uh, their financial records and everything. Had, did you, in any point of the designing the architecture, had to deal with any data privacy requirements or something specific in that terms? No, that's a, that's a very good question. So uh, to answer your question about uh, data privacy, uh, RoboBank, uh, any other bank, has uh, some policies in place about how to deal uh, uh, with uh, this, this data. Not everything can be collected and not everything can be stored. Uh, we had a... First, we had one issue. We couldn't just collect all the data that we wanted. And uh, because of that, uh, we had to, to uh, shrink our scope. But uh, also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there was some data that we wanted, but uh, we just couldn't get because uh, there were some regulations. Uh, during my project, uh, I was uh, working uh, together with uh, the data science team, but also uh, create providers from countries uh, in South America. And they have a set of regulations that is different from the ones we have here. So they, they, they couldn't just give us the data. They had to, to uh, go into meetings and check some, uh, that our systems were uh, according to their uh, requirements and also to send some paperwork to, to sign it and agree how we are going to, uh, to store and, and collect uh, this data. Uh, so the short answer, uh, yes. The long answer, uh, yes. It was a quite tedious process to do that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. your question. There was another question in the back, right? No? Okay. Um, so I think, um, what, any questions around here? No, right? Okay, so we have still the four more minutes, uh, so we have enough time. So Jorge, you are from Mexico. Yeah. You're one of my uh, few Mexicans. Very proud. Right? Very pr proud Mexican, uh, data scientist, and also software engineer, years of experience. Eh? And uh, when I look at your design, it's nice to see that uh, using the, what you have learned in our program, that you could put this tool together, right? Um, but one thing as looking back, as you know, as designers, you are taught to be reflective. Looking mm -hmm. back, what you could have improved in your design? What I could have improved? That's it's a, a big question, of course. Yeah, yeah. that's a very good You have good written question. technical reflection. I have seen the score, which is very good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so. Oh, someone is reading my reflection, <laughs> like that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, indeed, uh, what I, uh, if we can go back to the design, yeah, I have it here. So uh, what we can see is that this is a quite simple design, actually. It doesn't have that many elements, and uh, all the pieces that are here kind of like fit. Uh, but but uh, creating this kind of design uh, uh, took me quite uh, some time. Uh, I first was, I had to explore on, uh, my first approach was uh, how can I convince my fellow data scientists and data engineers to use uh, uh, these uh, tools, these techniques. 
And uh, as we, some of us might know, data scientists uh, are not software engineers. So they, they use uh, other kind of diagrams. And uh, what I was trying to do is just to, to appeal to them uh, to, to use uh, these uh, non-conventional diagrams to show them the information. And at the end, I, I, I came up with this, uh, which uh, shows uh, all the elements I want to, to, to provide, and also is a kind of like formal way of, of communicating with uh, software engineers. Looking back, I would have, uh, I would have do it uh, at the same time, not just start with one design for the data scientists and data uh, engineers, and then come back with a design for the uh, software engineers, but more like a, have a design for software, uh, yeah, software design, for software uh, architects and software uh, engineers, and uh, the same version for our data scientists and data engineers. I think that the, the job of the uh, designer, of an architect, is to provide the solution direction for the most difficult uh, elements that are uh, most critical. And in my case, it was to convince my uh, fellow uh, architects, uh, well, not fellow, my uh, architects, uh, and also data, so, uh, the data engineers and data scientists, that this has value. I know it has value, but I have to convince them, and I have to talk their language. So uh, both designs at the same time. That's something I would do. Very nice reflection, because um, you were involved in the design uh, and architecting of the last training project for the European Space Agency. We took uh, quite a big attention for that, because our trainees worked on detecting the emotion of the astronauts in the space using their voice and also the images. And I was quite enthusiastic about the technology, because like, I would like to use that on my trainees as well. I want to know their emotions during the training projects. But anyway, it was very well received, and I think very mostly you worked with the designers and software people, right? So I'm very happy to hear about this elegant design and how it was born. And I think the juniors, especially in attendance, and also the new trainees who are joining, I know one in attendance as well, it's really good reflection. I think we, we are going to have also uh, AI or software-related projects, so this is a very good one. How do we do interdisciplinary projects? Eh? So thank you, Jorge. Thank you, and uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, thank you. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Parima Mirshafei. Uh, she has done her project at uh, Philips. Um, it's the second time we have done a project for Philips Sustainability Group. I'm very proud about the results, yes, because this is a, a, we are contributing directly to the climate change. So Philips, um, you know all the consumer electronics or healthcare related products, right? But behind the scene, the company is also working very hard to improve uh, to, uh, the um, uh, solutions uh, to make sure to have uh, footprints that would have negative impact on the uh, climate. So this is an excellent uh, project uh, that we have worked with uh, Royal Philips uh, Sustainability Group. And uh, as you can see that she has contributed to improve the sustainability aspect within the Philips as a whole. So enjoy this talk. Thank you, Yanja. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Parima Mir Shafi, and as you already know, I am going, based on the previous presentation, I am going to explain my final bidding project to you. Uh, my project title is From Data to uh, Insight to, uh, to Insight to Drive Sustainable Change in Philips uh, Global Logistics Movement. This project was a collaboration between Philips and Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, in today's presentation, I am going to cover the following topics. First, I will explain the problem statement, and after that, the uh, solution approach, approach will be touched upon. Then we have the design and the design decisions that I made. After that, we uh, will talk about the evaluation, and uh, then we have the demo and the result. And finally, we have the conclusion and the future work. Uh, my project consists of two sections. The first part is uh, the logistics and the main part, and the other part is the lives improved. And due to the time limitation, I only um, focus on the logistics part in this presentation. Uh, sustainability is concerned as the long-term approach to have a, a holistic overview of environmental, social, and governance challenges also called ESG challenges. 
And in this research, we mainly focus on the environmental aspects, uh, specifically the global warming and the em emissions. Uh, emissions, uh, we have three scopes of emissions. Scope one are the uh, direct emissions that are, are owned and controlled by the company itself. Scope two are uh, the indirect emissions, including the purchased electricity, heating, cooling, and power. And scope three are uh, the emissions that are not directly carried out by the company, and it includes the transportation uh, activities. In this research, we uh, focused on transportation and distribution activities, uh, both in uh, downstream and upstream part. Uh, transportation activities, in particular, cause a lot of emissions. And they are contributing approximately 70% of uh, global greenhouse emissions. Um, also, within Philips, the most uh, emissions come from the scope 3. And within scope 3, we have the largest share uh, in the, uh, for the logistics. And for, by logistics, we mean uh, air, ocean, road, and parcel freight. So it is wise to investigate more on this section and try to reduce the CO2 emission as much as possible. But how should we, should we do that? Uh, Philips, as the pioneer in uh, reducing the CO2 emissions, has committed to become carbon neutral in its operation from 2020. Uh, Philips complies to this standard by first measuring and reporting all three scopes of emissions, then try to reduce as much as possible, and after that, uh, for the remaining section, they are going to um, buy. The, they are going to compensate it, for example, by buying the offset. The, uh, the offset. Um, and in this pr uh, project, we mainly focus on the measurement section. I think it is good to talk about the formal procedure that I followed to have this report ready uh, previously. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the sustainability team collected and uh, gathered all the data manually, and then they started uh, cleaning them and uh, extracted the, inf the desired information from them. After that, they calculated the uh, emission, the distance, and based on that, they calculated the CO2 emission. All of them were done manually, and then they had the report ready and sent it to the uh, managers, high-level managers, by email. As you may notice, uh, this procedure had some issues. For example, uh, it was really time-taking, gathering all this information and cleaning them every year manually uh, needs lots of human hours. Moreover, uh, as they, are, they were saving this data locally in their uh, systems, their risk of data loss was high. Uh, also, the transparency was missing because only a couple of people within a sustainability team was aware, aware of the procedure. And uh, as the distance was calculated based on the origin and destination city manually, uh, there could be some um, errors on that and it couldn't be uh, as precise as they wanted. Uh, also, since we calculated the emission based on the uh, distance, uh, based on those distance, then the emission was not um, accurate enough. And uh, the last but not least, we ha they had the data uh, yearly updated. And uh, as you know right now, the, uh, there are some rapid changes in this situation, and making decisions based on the yearly uh, updated data is not really proper. So they came up with this project, and uh, they uh, developed the logistic, uh, freight, logistics freight dashboard to calculate the distance uh, automatically, then calculate the CO2 emissions based on that. After that, providing the report with the real-time data and uh, automate the process of gathering and getting all the information and cleaning them. And finally, providing the holistic view of necessary information uh, based on the, each mode of transport. So what did I do? Uh, yeah, and the scope of the project, of course, is uh, designing and implementing the uh, ocean freight dashboard, um, parcel shipment dashboard, integrating the existing air freight dashboard to, uh, to the uh, previous ones, and enhancing the lives improved dashboard. So what did I do to have and achieve those goals? Uh, first, I tried to determine the data sources and provide the um, requirements to the data providers. 
After that, I worked on the distance calculation section to have this application automated. Uh, then we calculated the distance, uh, the emissions based on that distance, and in some cases, we changed the methodology. For example, uh, for the ocean freight, they previously used the DEFRA, but right now they are working on uh, clean cargo working group methodology. And after that, we had the dashboard ready uh, in, and implemented, and then we, have it, we had it uh, verified and validated. Uh, in order to get the proper output, I needed some, uh, uh, an architectural pattern. Architectural pattern uh, refers to a generic, frequent uh, solution that uh, is used for common, and free, for, uh, common problems in software domain uh, to um, address the needs. So as this, proce this uh, project was a web-based project, I, uh, I decided to use the layered architecture because it is commonly used between the programmers. It is easy to maintain and enhance and extend that, the application. The layered architecture contains uh, three, layer, uh, three layers and uh, tires. Uh, the first one, we have the data management layer, um, that we have the data and store the data there. After that, we have the business logic layer that uh, we have our logics there. And at the end, we have the presentation layer that where we have the user interface uh, and the client can use uh, the application. After deciding about the um, architectural pattern, it's time to make decisions for the most important parts of the uh, application. One of the most important parts and essential uh, section in this application, in this project, was the distance calculator. I divided this section into two parts, uh, the inland calculation and the coastal part. For both of them, I investigated on different approaches and uh, method methods, uh, and I, uh, for example, um, uh, compare them based on different criteria, for instance, the accuracy, having API, uh, the price, and other information. For the inland section, I decided to use Bing Maps API because it was free and uh, it uh, showed the shortest travel time. Also, the same procedure was, uh, happening, uh, was uh, done for the uh, coastal calculation part. Uh, I worked on different uh, methods from developing the map and road from scratch by myself to having the distance matrix uh, ready and get it from other companies. But at the end, I uh, decided to use the Aquaplot API because it was cheap, cheaper than the other uh, scenarios. And also, it worked with the coordinates. And it is necessary because we were independent to the uh, other um, port names in the application. So after having everything ready and this, uh, decided, now it's time to design the application. Uh, I came up with, uh, we came up with this design. Uh, it's a modular design. It's easy to maintain and enhance it. Uh, later on, for example, after a while, we can add another mode of transport to this one without any need for changing the current uh, scenario. Also, it is good to mention that all of these applications and these components um, are documented based on a business process model uh, named Bizagi. Uh, this tool is commonly used within sustainability team. Uh, here I chose the, uh, the easiest one because it should be fit in the, in the screen. Uh, as you can see, we, have, we can have the data flow and data structure, uh, everything ready and uh, written, documented in this application. Uh, since we talked about the um, design calculation part, it is good to take a uh, look at, at this part in more detail. For the ocean freight dashboard, I, uh, we calculated the, dis the, the distance from origin city to port of loading, port of loading to port of discharge, port of discharge to destination city. Also for the parcel freight, we calculated the distance from origin city to destination city. For the green parts, I, I used the Bing Maps API because it was the inland section, and for the uh, blue parts, I used the Aquaplot API because it was on the ocean and the coastal part. Now that we have everything ready, it's time to validate the dashboard and verify it. Validation means uh, checking if the 
uh, if the result and that the software can um, satisfy the requirements or not. In order to achieve those goals, I uh, followed two approaches. The first one was having bi some bi-weekly uh, meetings uh, with the key stakeholders. Uh, some demonstrations, I showed the application to them and then I received the feedback and for the next two uh, weeks I worked on that and added more functionality to it and then we repeated this uh, procedure for the uh, whole time. Moreover, uh, I deployed the, uh, uh, the application to the acceptance and production environment so then uh, around 40 main stakeholders could have access to that one and validate the uh, dashboards, and also they provided me some feedback. Then it's time to, uh, for verification. A verification means um, checking if the final output and the software uh, works without any bugs or not. In order to achieve those goals, uh, that goal, uh, I uh, followed four steps. At first, I defined some uh, uh, measures for example, the total weight, total spent, number of shipments, and then uh, I uh, compared them across all the components in the application, and I got the same result. Then, uh, as I created, uh, as I uh, gathered the data from different pro uh, data providers, uh, and they also had some um, other measures, I uh, compared those measures with uh, those results and measures with mine, and uh, hopefully I got the same result. So we have the complete data. After that, I worked on the presentation layer. I did some t testing in that layer to make sure the filters are working perfectly. And at the end, uh, I'm happy to say that the application is SOX compliant. SOX compliance uh, refers to an annual audit in which the um, software companies are obliged to make, to provide the proof of data accuracy and completeness. And hopefully uh, we, we, uh, we could have that one uh, because it's a very valuable step to ensure the uh, dashboard is um, complete, the data is complete. Now the theory part is enough, it's time to take a look at the application. Uh, as you can see here, we have the, we have on a landing page that we have all mode of the transport together at the same time. And uh, here we can navigate to the ocean freight section, we have some elements here. And uh, for example, we have the map here, you can uh, click on a specific road and see the uh, information related to that one. Then we can navigate again to the landing page. We can go to Ocean Freight this time. Uh, we have this uh, section that we can take a look at the uh, origin and destination uh, relation based on the tone CO2. And we have also this uh, storytelling section. We provide some information related to each mode of transport specifically. There are some extra information about that one that user can help user can uh, use that. Then we navigate to the uh, main dashboard again, the landing page. This time we can navigate to the parcel freight shipment. And we have almost the same information. And for example, here we have the, uh, here we have the trend line. And uh, we can say, take a look at the tone CO2 emissions uh, over the past three years. In conclusion, I uh, developed and designed the logistics freight dashboard to provide the holistic view of uh, different mode of transport. After that, I redesigned uh, the lives improved dashboard. Then we evaluated the application based on different uh, methodology, for example, uh, having the bi-weekly demonstration, UAT, and uh, predefined measures. And then also I provided some extra information for, the, for Philips, for example, having the business process modeling and uh, the dashboard and all the scripts. Uh, also, I have some uh, suggestions for the future work. I think it is good to have the uh, to use some uh, machine learning algorithms in order to uh, see what will happen in the future if we continue our current decisions in terms of the diffused CO2 emissions. Moreover, it is good to use a database uh, software because right now all the information are stored in uh, Excel and CSV files. So if we have the database, we can uh, fetch the data faster and safer, and also we can monitor them. 
Um, moreover, it is good to have the data, uh, data warehouse because uh, then we can have a structured data there and uh, everyone within Philips can get those information and also enrich the data. And uh, it is uh, very good to have the last mode of transport added to the, da to the dashboard. In this uh, term, then we, have, we can have everything at the same time at the same time and we can cover everything. And finally, I want to thank you for being here and listening to my presentation. If you have any other questions, I will be very happy to answer. Thank you very much. So, any questions? I think, uh, yeah, Han has a question. Um, yeah, Parima, nice presentation, by the way. Um, Maybe you told me, and I just do not fully understand. Is the, um, is the result uh, a, a dashboard that can be used uh, just for reporting how good uh, Philips is in sustainability, etc.? Or is it also a decision support tool where people can decide uh, whether or not uh, to go uh, by air or by sea, or maybe even select certain suppliers who are doing better or not there? And so it wasn't totally clear for me. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, there is... a. Mostly it's about uh, having, uh, providing the information for the managers and other people uh, within Philips. And uh, based, on this, based on the KPIs that we provided on the dashboard, we, uh, people can compare, for example, what would be the cost or the ton CO2 emissions if you use um, each mode of transport. For example, right now we know that uh, the ocean freight has the lowest uh, impact uh, on the uh, global warming. Um, yes, it is possible to, to see that one, and also it is possible to uh, select each, uh, for example, uh, forwarder or carrier, or uh, a specific, um, for example, how can I say, for example, DHL or UPS or any other carrier to see uh, what is the um, diffuse so, uh, ton CO2 emissions in a specific trade lane. Yeah, okay. it's possible. Very good, yeah. Okay. Um, I think I will ask also another question about uh, stakeholders. Huh? Yes. So, of course, as part of the training, stakeholder management was one of the key um, workshops and courses. Um, you have had quite many, I think 13, 14 stakeholders. How did you manage your stakeholders, especially if there were, if, uh, there were conflicting requirements? How did you manage it? Yeah, or were there uh, any? Yeah, there were some um, stakeholders for this project. And uh, whenever I face some issues with uh, these problems, I set a meeting with all of them together, and then I provide the, I explain the situation and say, okay, you uh, needed this information, you needed this information, and, and we have some conflict here. And when, whenever I explain it and uh, make everyone sit together, then they could find it, they could solve the issue. Yeah, <laughs> so it's the best way, I think. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, did you use any of the um, power and interest um, map from uh, Natalia Fokena's course or for the stakeholders? Yeah, yeah. I, ha I created that one uh, for the first, uh, in the first two or three months of the project, I created that map and uh, I showed them to the main stakeholders. It's a bit risky to show it to everyone. Uh, but yeah, I could use it in the first month to um, identify the stakeholders, the main stakeholders, their effects on this project. And uh, yeah, it was very helpful for me. Yeah. And you have had uh, bi-weekly um, demo sessions, eh? so it's quite a big pressure on um, designing and developing. Um, were there any moments that you couldn't achieve your, let's say, epic? Yeah. And then you had to change it or you had to negotiate? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I had, I faced uh, this issue on the um, it was on, I think, um, end of July when I thought the first, the, the major part is implemented and I noticed I have to change everything. Um, but hopefully I worked with a very great team <laughs> and they helped me and uh, yeah, I could uh, achieve the goals. And yeah, in some cases it was possible that I couldn't uh, get these bi-weekly uh, bi bi meetings, but uh, I could compensate them later. So. Thank you. Any questions so far? We have still uh, two more minutes. Uh, if not, I will also ask you one more question about reflection. Eh? So, of course, you write 
the mm. reflection parts. I have read it also. So what is the biggest lesson learned, looking back? Uh, the biggest one. I think for this project, the biggest part was uh, do not underst underestimating the uh, data providers and the communication within the structure of the, the company, the company uh, structure. Because um, when you are working, you are, for example, when you are working with data, you are dependent to other teams and other uh, departments within uh, your company. And of course, it's not their uh, first priority to provide you the data, the correct data to answer to you. And um, I think the most important part is uh, and the lesson was um, communicate with them very well, write everything, send everything, talk to their managers, <laughs> and uh, get the hand sh handshake whenever you need something from them. Not just during the meeting say something and then they say accepted, okay, we agreed, but then they will forget. And uh, this is also to note, uh, we have a follow-up project uh, defined uh, based on Parima's uh, project results. So um, we have quite high competition for the projects because we have way more projects than the trainees. So, but we really hope that there would be a match and you would have a follow-up nice project. Yeah, sure. uh, okay, so thank you again, Parima. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to have a coffee. Oh. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's my honor to work with you. <laughs> so this happens also with our trainees. So I think a lot of our graduates have received a job offer from the same company. They have done their graduation projects. So yeah, thank you very much. So we're going to have coffee break for half an hour in, the, in this place for Hof. And before that, I have placed the live streaming link on my uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. So please share it further just to make sure other people can see it. We are also going to post it on our uh, PDA and software technology uh, social media pages, uh, which you can share further because we have also many more interesting talks uh, coming up. So thank you and then see you in an half an hour.
joining us at dinner. Yes. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we both. We both uh, <laughs> you won't regret it. Just a short time. Just a short time. <laughs> no, no, too much pressure. So welcome back everybody. I hope you have freshened up quite well with the coffee and cookies. So our next session um, is starting now. We have two presentations before the lunch uh, break. So first one is Chris O'Hara, Christopher O'Hara, who has done his graduation project at Siemens. Leuven, this is the second time we have done the project with them. It's in Belgium, but most of the work is most likely done online. Um, so welcome, Chris. Can everybody see my slides? That's kind of a Zoom joke now, right? So uh, my name is Christopher O'Hara. I'm going to be presenting to you the project that I did here at the PD, uh, for the PDN project. It's the Concurrent Generative Engineering Tooling uh, Platform. This was together with ZMIMS. Uh, so let me give you the agenda. So the first thing I'll talk about a little bit is the background, because you probably want to understand why we're doing this. Uh, we have this uh, problem description, what's going on, what hasn't been done before. Uh, stakeholder analysis, who are end users, who do we care about? The solution domain, like how are we going to try to solve this problem? Uh, a little bit of verification, and then some conclusion. So the background. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our sponsor, which is ZMIMS, Digital Industry Software. You may have heard of them. They're a really large German company related to uh, a lot of innovative projects, mostly related to software now. Uh, they, of course, had, uh, traditionally made things like refrigerators or type of uh, PLC machines, but now they're really moving into the digital forefront. So they make a lot of innovative uh, technology and software for aerospace, automotive, manufacturing. Uh, they want to develop software that really enhances collaborative type of behaviors, not just between engineers and engineering teams, but also related to the project management. So if we develop something, we can explain it, we have traceability, and we can show our results to project management. And they want to improve the communication between these different layers and different domains. So first, what is concurrent engineering? So you may know what sequential engineering is, right? I have a task, and I, I complete my part, and I give it to somebody else. They complete their task. So if I'm a tester, maybe I'm, I have the last thing to do, and we have a designer, and we're kind of separated. But with concurrent engineering, we actually want to all work together. So instead of having just a, a single uh, architect that we go to, or, or, or just going directly sequentially in a line, we, we sit together, we work together in a multidisciplinary, multi-domain area, and we try to build this, this product together, explore this experiment together. So it's multidisciplinary, it's multi-domain, it's a holistic bird's eye view, everybody in the team has to have this really system level, system awareness of the entire pr uh, domain, and you want to get this consensus and the, and the, and the overall architecture that you're going to build for uh, a, a project or a product or a mission, you want to try to make sure that we together, we all understand the same topics and we build the same thing. Uh, according to the European Space Agency, using concurrent uh, engineering, current, concurrent design, it's a factor for reduction in time. So instead of it taking two years to envision a project, it only takes six months, uh, half the cost, and you could run parallel studies. So this is a, a design or, a, or manufacturing method to try to make new products. What is generative engineering? So generative engineering, actually what we do is we try to envision what are all, if we have a component, an item, uh, a machine, we try to figure out what are all of the ports, what are all of the things that are going to go into this that we can design. So a simple example would be if we have a, a robot and it has a LiDAR, and we say, OK, what about, how would it perform if it had a radar, right? So you can imagine for self-driving cars or other things. So if we can just change one component, what does this look like? And what you do is you try to develop every single combination possible. And that's what they do. They automatically generate up to millions of architectures that you can also put these specific parameters in. How much does it weigh? What's the accuracy, right? And 
you can actually go through and validate all of this, get some initial validation of, of what the system level performance will be, and even do some uh, reliability and uh, uh, component fault tree analysis, try to figure out where's the product going to fail. So as, it takes this quantitative information, generates lots of architectures. So the nice thing is you can generate architectures that people didn't even think of, because you're just specifying the input-output relationships. So sometimes we have this idea of what it should look like, and this way you don't have to. But currently, it's being used by a single user in a single domain. So generative engineering is usually just one team, one subsystem team or one designer. Uh, they're not working concurrently. So then this leads us into this idea of it hasn't been shown yet how to integrate generative engineering and concurrent engineering. So how do we do this? What's the approach? Well, we have this idea that the optimal architecture is somewhere in the design space, and we're generating the entire des design space, every possible architecture configuration. But we need to incorporate some, uh, some synchronized solutions. We need to have everything, that we, everything we work on as a team should be synchronized. It should be consistent. It should improve our communication. We should be talking about the same thing. We should be able to trace our design decisions back to why we picked something, why we made a decision. And we also might want to access external technologies for evaluation, for storage, for analysis. So we started with this example. Uh, we, we went through the conceptual FireSat uh, project. FireSat is a, a network of satellites. And basically what we did is we tried to incorporate the different users that would be building this type of problem. And, uh, and then start with this and see where we can get to. So we started with just the evaluation data, meaning the architectures have been generated and they've been, the quantitative things have been scored, but that's it. So we go to stakeholders. This is an example of a concurrent design facility uh, from uh, the European Space Agency, ESTEC, here in the Netherlands. You don't need to worry about all the different acronyms, but these are subsystem teams. So in any different uh, CDF, concurrent design facility, you might have 20 or 30 subsystem teams working together to solve a problem. So that's a lot of stakeholders to try to satisfy all their needs and constraints at the same time. So what we're going to do is some dimensionality reduction. My project is a proof of concept. We try to see, can it be done? So we pick four subsystem teams. We'll call them mechanical. EPS is electrical power supply. AOCS is attitude and orbital control system. And prop is for propulsion. And we identify what type of concerns that they have first on the quantitative level. So propulsion might care about thrust, the power for the jet to go. Mechanical is, they might be concerned with the dimensions. AOCS is, uh, they care about the bandwidth, uplink, downlink from a satellite. And EPS cares about the actual, the power generation and power consumption, right? So these are quantitative. We can put numbers on what they expect. But then we have some non-quantitative things, like qualitative and attribute, uh, architectural attributes. So we might care about the testability of a system, scalability, interoperability, reusability, for architectural components, we might care about the coupling, how tightly coupled are the components, what design patterns did we use, is this design pattern influence the overall shape that we can have, the ports, maybe we have this type of uh, network and we want to plug the, the port, the component doesn't match, and uh, multiplicity, maybe we want to have two batteries, five, ten sensors, so we care about these things, and, but th for these things, you'll get different answers from different architects or different system engineers. So we have to keep them separate. So what we do is we start to envision our domain. We try to do some domain analysis. We start with the different type of attributes that we have on one side. On the other side, we have the actual the use case and the, the mission and operational requirements, and we try to have the designers satisfy their needs and their attributes within the scope of the mission. Once we've done this, we can go through the experiment, we can evaluate it where we generate the architectures, then we have this thing we're going to call liking, ranking, and scoring, because how do we communicate our ideas? How do we communicate, this is what I expect in an architecture? So if I like this architecture, or if I don't like it, if we can trace this back with a score, then this is a way to communicate what we like and not. And then after we've scored them, we can analyze them for different type of results and different type of output. So from the end user's perspective, what do they want? We started with these different architectures. They're translated into a CSV file initially. This is what I was given. And I was asked, how can we do something with this? So looked up four different use cases on the perspective of, of, a, of an end user at a CDF, where we have graph databases, experiment tracking software, data storage, and user-defined features. 
So example uh, for a da graph database, maybe a data scientist or a data analyst, they say, hmm, there's some relationships between these different components I talked about. If we change out this type of sensor with this one, how does, what happens? Is it better? Is it worse? And they want to actually trace this down to the, the relationship level. Experiment tracking, you might have a different, maybe a simulation engineer. And what they want to do is they want to say, hmm, We've gone over this iterative process of reviewing five or six times. How did this architecture change? How did our score, how do we think about it change? Or we want to compare five or six architectures. We want to do some filtering, look at which is the best one. For our data solutions, we need to have something from a model-based engineering uh, perspective. We really need to have some type of consistent storage location where we're putting everything together. So you might want to look at something like a, a extract transform load pipeline or object storage, or because maybe the database isn't going to work for you. You have lots of different type of data. And then, of course, users also, uh, nowadays, they really like to have their own ability to make custom features. So it's great that we have this, uh, this technology. But what we want to do is I want to use my custom scripts or my, the code that I've written, something if I have some formal analysis code, I want to do this. You can make it either a wrapper or a script. You want to integrate it into the system. So then we map out our entire domain. We have our stakeholders, some technologies they like. And we have this uh, collaboration that we want to see. And we start to try to envision our solution architecture. So what did we decide? Well, we first looked at the positioning of what the boundary of, be will of, uh, of our project will be. So we try to integrate the two, concurrent engineering and generative engineering, together. And then what we try to do is identify the system of system components, draw our boundary, and try to really figure out what are our interfaces. So what we decided to do is Zemums has their own internal software called Studio, and we're gonna, we were going to develop my solution as part of their solution inside. So how do we do that? Well, first we look at the user's perspective one more time, go through the use cases. Right? They have these different technologies that they want to use. They have these different uh, processes that they want to conduct. Some people will be producing the architecture. Some people will be using the architectures. So we try to really get a good understanding of this. And we say, OK, we know our domain. We know our scope. And we see that we have some type of maybe a pipeline solution. We have all these different components. But not every project's going to use the same technology. right? Maybe, I, maybe this project uses a graph database and this one doesn't. Uh, not even every team member is going to use the same technology. So one analyst might need this, but the simulation engineer needs something else. And it would be nice, though, if we have other projects, we can still reuse them. And it should be easy to use, easy to install, um, save time, reduce uh, uh, resources like uh, cost. So let's think about this. And we decide to go with an architecture, a plugin architecture. So what a plugin architecture is, is it's this type of, uh, you have this core in the middle, like a host program. And you have different plugins that can attach to it. So a lot of the software people here probably have used something that has plugins. If you haven't, that's OK. It's really simple. You just have some type of software, and you plug things into it. Uh, you can build these, uh, uh, the, these uh, applications that are modular, customizable. You can focus on the feature, design, uh, feature designs that they want. If they don't need something, they don't need to use it. If they do want something, they can use it. If you have legacy code or code in another type of language, you can make wrappers to go around it. Um, and also for testing or for debugging, if these are all modular, they're little islands, you can really uh, cut them off from the rest of it and debug them, find out if there's any problems. And from the end users, they also get to, they can limit their code size. How, how big is this final project? They can uh, simplify their APIs. So there's lots of really nice benefits they can have. If they don't have, if there's a feature they don't want, they can just disable it. And we went with this design instead of a, say, completely microservices design where you have everything is out external, which we can have some security problems there. Uh, and also, we don't want a monolithic. We don't want to make, uh, say, a, a, this technology solution for everything. So in the middle, we put our project, which is Cogent. And then we identified some of those uh, plugins that we want, and we started making plugins. So from the user's perspective, all they see is we have a lunch, bunch of architectures. We have these users in the middle. They do some iterative design. Then they get consensus in this, this is the best architecture for our, for our needs. They can connect to a desired uh, storage solution. And they have access to some plugins. So they can do some analysis and external things like versioning. So from their perspective, it's just, they just do th their normal business. 
What does the process flow look like? Because we have different users now, how do we solve this problem? We put the, uh, this uh, A0 is an orchestrator, so let's say they're a lead system architect, they generate the models, and they send them to a cloud storage, which different users will download these models from. Then they will do their processes that they want, some analysis, they will send all their models back, and it doesn't have to be simultaneous, it just looks like it from here. They send them back to cloud, then the orchestrator downloads them and merges them. But there was one problem. This is a concept, uh, a proof of concept pro uh, project, right? I can't just go to European Space Agency and say, let me borrow 20 of your best teams. So what we're going to do with these different uh, subsystem teams is we're going to make agents to represent them. So we call these concurrent agents. What they do is they try to act like uh, the subsystem designers. They do this by doing three things. Well, plus an initial thing, which is they pretend to think about the architecture. Then what they do is they, they can generate for uh, three different quality attributes a score between one and five randomly. We have some threshold, let's say it's 12. If the summation of their three scores is bigger than the threshold, they like the architecture. If it's smaller, they don't like it. And uh, they can generate these random design decisions using a simple corpus. So it just generates some simple text. So, of course, in real life, they would write something meaningful, but we just say, this is a step they will take. And we feel like this was a, a sufficient enough to show our uh, stakeholders that we can at least have an end-to-end -end trace of the system. So in conclusion, we had a lot of real, high-level uh, realizations we wanted to meet. And we started with just a small data set. And we actually were able to make this end-to-end -end process with uh, about 20 different plugins. We could store our, our assets, our metadata, everything in uh, object storage solution. Everything is, was consistent and synchronized, so even if we had out-of-order operations, it didn't mess anything up. Uh, and we had uh, several uh, external examples like Neo4j and uh, WANDB, uh, weights and biases. So, and one really important key thing is this realization of how generative engineering can greatly enhance concurrent engineering. That's on the next slide. Um, but one key thing for the next steps is we need some human testing. And what we recommend is that we have all these different users, we have different layers, and we remember we had the quantitative attributes, and then we had qualitative and architectural. So for quantitative, this can be solved by generative engineering. The more things you can make quantitative, the better. So if you can transfer some of the uh, qualitative attributes, like reliability, if you can make this quantitative, then you can, you can solve this. You can generate, use AI to generate solutions. Other things could be solved by concurrent engineering. We communicate our ideas, our problems, our concerns, and we need, to do, we need to spend as little time in the generative phase for quantitative things and more, times in, more time in the, the concurrent uh, phase. We can use this for smart farming, industrial IoT, automotive domain, robotics, healthcare, or demotics, which is uh, uh, smart homes, right? Because any type of system that has subsystems and components, we've made everything, our meta models on a high level, so you can abstract away the name of the thing and actually just change the name, and if it has similar ports or similar components, you're good to go. So some challenges and lessons learned. It can be really hard to prioritize on a really innovative, state-of-the-art, conceptual project because other teams are working on stuff. Uh, also, you have different, you have this topic, we're going to do this, and then it changes, we're not going to do this anymore. So you have to pivot a lot, you have to really be flexible. And then sometimes you read about the, 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 the specifications of a design alternative, right? Some technology sounds great, has everything I need, perfect license, it's free. But then when you go to implement it, it doesn't work like it's supposed to. So there's some trial and error that has to go in to find out this, uh, the, the expected or unexpected behavior, especially when you're making plugins because they become difficult to integrate. And this is a, a, just an example of our system decomposition. I, I realize you probably can't see it in the back, but we have made lots of different plugins. They communicate over some different APIs. And, uh, and, and the, the, the ZMIMS is happy, so I'm happy. So thank you for your attention. At this time, if you have any questions, we'll take them. Thank you, Chris. So Tom, go ahead. Sure. You can I'll repeat it. Microphone. Nice presentation, Chris. Oh, thank you, sir. 
So my question is about the validation agents. Um, so your validation agents, they uh, produce randomized opinions, right? Yes. Uh, typically, if you validate a system, you want uh, your tests to be deterministic. Um, if they produce randomized results, then they are not deterministic. Um, how is this not a problem in your case? Yeah. It's not a problem because even though these are random, they're not actually purely random. So it is deterministic, meaning for each different keyword that they could say, everything was built into dictionaries, right? So it can take it out of this dictionary, uh, excellent, uh, 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 terrible. It would take these different type of keywords, and you have basically, I created a grammar. So what you do is you have uh, this type of noun, or this, uh, this, per this person, user one, likes this because this. So each of these dictionaries is fixed, and you can run unit tests on your dictionaries to make sure that, right, it, if, if you, if it, it doesn't expect some word that's not in the dictionary. So you run your test on the actual dictionary. So it, what they do is, what they generate is random, but it's fixed. So like a random, also for the scoring, right, between one and five. So if I try to give it a, a six, what happens? Oh, it's going to crash, make an exception. So it's deterministic, or it's random, but it's contained random. It's not stochastic. Uh, stochastic. Yeah, but but if you, I understand that. Uh, but if you run the test again, and uh, uh, the, the same agent uh, is called, does it then give uh, the same result? or? Does it give a different result? Different result. Well, you could, you could set the flag, uh, basically, if you wanted to have the same result. No, no, the, the final implementation, the one I really tested was, it always gives a different result. It's, it's basically completely random every time. And remember, this is going to output something like a string. And this, we can put also a requirement on. We only accept strings in our, uh, in our JSON file, right? In our format. We only accept this. So we test for this, too. All right. Does Thanks. that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. The next one. Dan? Uh, hey, Chris. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is about uh, your system, which I think at some point you presented as a kind of black box, which you randomly generate the architecture of. And, and so, so when you generate all these architectures, do you maintain those interfaces that you mentioned? Okay. And uh, is there some way to tell the generator to, I don't know, aim towards uh, satisfying a certain quality attribute? Or maybe that's outside of your scope? So this was actually, this is outside of my scope, but it is something I investigated. On the architecture generation level, they actually didn't want to put any type of constraints or anything like this. They first want to generate every possible combination, right? Because this selecting of a quality attribute or quanti quanti qualitative quantitative attribute, any of them, when you start to filter these out, you start to act more like a, the, the experienced designer, right? We know that we don't like these architectures. But then there might be some novel solutions in there that you're filtering out, right? So a car, we have an engine on top of the car. This doesn't make sense to us, but actually this could be the best car in the world. So you can't do it in the generation, but afterwards we do have filtering where you actually can filter out these uh, attributes how you want them. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. And other questions? Uh, Han. Yeah, thanks. Hey, long time no see. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because you didn't call me. <laughs> oh, I apologize. <laughs> um, good presentation, uh, Chris. Uh, I, I have one question. So, um, I think very often in, in during a project, uh, people have new insights uh, and uh, uh, things may change uh, for them. Uh, but then, uh, of course, you can run this again uh, there. But then people say, hey, I'm already halfway uh, there. I can't change anything anymore. And so you end up uh, to a maybe suboptimal architecture uh, there, but given the situation, still the best. Uh, how does your system deal with that? Ooh, that's a really good question. So again, Sorry. on the architectural generation level, all the architectures are generated based on the constraints, right? But on the other hand, when we're going through it, we try to, if, if we want to abandon architect, uh, an architecture, you can do this. So you need to be able to specify, like, maybe we start this design process, it's iterative, they go through in batches, and they say, this one is not going to work. They, will, they can just discard it. And they do this already without architect, architecture generation. So the concurrent designs, like you said, sometimes they're like, they're in the middle of it, and they say, this is not going to work out. They just abandon it or park it. And what we also want to do with this is take the traceability of their design decisions. Why are you parking it? What was insufficient? And use this in a database. 
Long, long term scope is we have all this information, we can predict which architectures will fail, which ones will be good, but this is way like 10, 20 years. Yeah, but so, I think what you say is that in the reiteration and there, uh, you limit the space of uh, total solutions uh, there and then find the solution there. Correct. And optimal there. Okay, thanks. We call it down selecting. Okay, thank you, Han. Luis, can you put your slide? I think there was another question here, no? Rogier? Yeah, Rogier Houston has a question. Thank you very much. If if it is allowed for... Oh, oh one more question. Last one, last one. more question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sir. It's an interesting topic. I wondered whether your architecture is also generated by the tool itself. If the architectures were generated what? Your architecture is also generated by the tool. Oh, yes, it was. So this was actually part of uh, the, one of the underlying requirements that they wanted to find was, was the architecture that the architects would pick in the design space? I had hoped so. Yeah. Good. And if you filter, within two-step filtering, you can actually find this architecture... Uh, on the Pareto chart. So it is in the design space, and uh, we also envision that if there's a, a thousand architectures and this one was the one that people really liked, two or three steps will find it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. So I think um, since my research field is also software architecture, I'm going to ask you also the question about the designer agents. So I think uh, in the, it's not far in the future we're going to have designer agents, but how do you see that it's going to be used within our program? Maybe it's too broad question. Oh, this is a great question. So one of the biggest things about this is we have to have human in the loop. Right? So hum like you're not going to take the human out of the loop in architecture design. I don't, I don't believe it's, after 10 months of this, I don't believe it's ever possible. But you can use them to really quickly do filtering, ranking. If you want to put weights on different uh, attributes, they can actually do this automatically. Or if you need a, a random thing to happen, right? Sorry, Tom, but kind of random thing. You can do this. So I think agents will be really important in, in generating some of the information, uh, filtering, processing, pruning, Actually going through this information and making it to where the things that me and you care about as uh, architects, we have this in front of us and we can talk about this and not talk about something like um, how much energy is it going to use. We can talk about that, but it, we, it's already fixed, so let's just put it over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how would you do, you know, because you were involved in the designing of the project for the Volvo car. So last year we did for the first time project for Volvo cars in Sweden. So. Um, Chris was uh, one of the designers, product owners involved in the project, and that time we did at meta level. We designed something, of course, highly confidential for them, which was highly valued by them. But now looking back, do you think there is a possibility to apply some of your uh, results into the meta level? Uh, yes. So actually, the framework. Yeah. So I, it turns out I really like the meta level or the meta meta level, right? This M2 level, yeah. uh, because. On the high level, you, if you have everything kind of abstract, it becomes a little problematic for some of the developers, but you can actually replace these different components. So we, for Volvo, we created an architecture framework for this design of products where they have different life cycles. This is an example of a product that has different life cycles, right? This Firesat's uh, solution. And actually, I think what we designed for Volvo would work for this, and I think what we, what we did for this will work for Volvo, so maybe we should... Uh, Maybe we'll talk after. Yeah, this is an, definitely <laughs> an interesting research uh, direction, and I think uh, thank you for that. So thank you again, Chris. <laughs> so our next speaker is Roma, uh, Luis Roma Barge. So he has done his project for the NWO uh, project. He's going to talk about it uh, in a minute. It's on uh, behavioral animal science using also AI and pipelines. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, my name is Luis Roma Barge, as they introduced, and this is the title of my project, The Design of the Inside Pipeline for Behavioral Animal Science and Animal Breeding. This will be the agenda. I will start by introducing the context. I will explain a bit about the problems we face in the imaging problem in the project, and I will show some of my proposed solutions for these problems, and I will finalize with the conclusion and the recommendations. Here you can see the main protagonist of my project, the laying hens and the pigs. And why is this? In the last decades, human population has increased exponentially. And thanks to this, or due to this, uh, also the food consumption are the food necessities for the humanity. As a result, some of the farms where the animal lives get overcrowded. And the animals, uh, even in the best farms, they may suffer 
and they can become stressed. When this happens, they uh, may have some uh, bad behavior. And this is because they cannot establish the proper hierarchies that they have in the wild. In the worst case, the pigs bite at each other and they can hurt in the tails, and the chickens peck at each other, or they can even stack on top of each other, causing suffocation and death. And what we want to do in imaging is to analyze this behavior, understanding them, and try to prevent them. Uh, the animals have social interactions, just like humans, and I think everyone here, after these two years, understands how important the social interactions are. And to understand these uh, social interactions, we have the behavioral researchers who perform behavioral analysis. One can think that this only consists on observing the animals, but in reality, these have a lot of complex uh, things that you have to consider. Maybe you have hundreds of animals in the pen. Uh, similar interactions may have different meaning for the animals. There can be some environmental conditions, and the also important the animal genes, and other stuff. Uh, so at the end, what we have is complex data that needs to be analyzed to understand this problem. And something is missing in the middle, how you understand this complex data. For this, we have the imaging program. This is a NWO-funded program, and it's, a cons it's carried out by a consortium of Dutch universities, Dutch IT companies, genetic and breeding companies, also uh, the Dutch Society for Farmers, and the Dutch Society for the Protection of the Animals. What the imaging wants to achieve is to understand animal behavior and integrate it with the genomics of the animals in order to increase the welfare of the animal. They want to create what they call super social animals, animals that react better to these sometimes not so good uh, environments that they believe. And here I'm going to present you the goals of imaging. They want to address these animal social interactions, they want to improve the health and the welfare, and of course they also want to try to in, uh, reduce the ecological footprint of the food production. They want to understand the social and genetic factors in order to produce healthier animals. To do this, they use the following tools. They want to use the computer vision, they want to do uh, data analytics, and they want to perform behavioral analysis. The, the end goal of the, for these tools is to automatically detect individual traits in large groups. I'm going to talk to you about the data collection in this project. Uh, imagine we have one farm. In these farms, we have many pens, and in each of these pens, there are uh, tens to hundreds of animals. Each of these pens is recorded by two cameras that are recording 24 hours per day, seven days per week. As a result, we have what we call a data explosion. In some cases, we are producing even more than one terabyte per day. And this is double, because we have the pig project and the chicken project. Uh, to add into this, the farms, one is in Utrecht and the other is in Bolmer in Germany. And the research groups, one is in Utrecht and the other two are in Banningen and Eindhoven. All the people from this research group need to have access to the data. And they also need to be able to communicate with each other the data and the deep learning models that they produce or the results of the behavioral analysis. So what we need is that the data is fair what they call FAIR, which means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is the second problem of the project. And <clears throat> as I told you, the, in this project we have deep learning models, and I'm going to explain very briefly how these are produced. We have some data, in this case, the videos of the animals, and this data is uh, separated in training and testing data. With the training data, you produce a deep learning model, and with the testing data, you test if the deep learning model is accurate enough. If it's accurate, we keep it. If it's not accurate enough, we go back and to the beginning. This is already a, a tiring and complex process, but in imaging, the hardest part comes before the training on the data annotation. I'm going to explain you how the data annotation works. Before, before, uh, before the computer vision algorithms can predict and detect animals, we need to teach them how to do it. And to do this so, we need to 
explain them how to, uh, how to find the animals in the pictures. So imagine we have a video uh, recorded as in 30 FPS, and it's a one minute video, so we have uh, 1,800 frames. Imagine that we only annotate one of uh, 10, one out of 10 frames, so only 180 frames. And annotation consists in drawing the bounding box around the animal. And this bounding box, you also need to write the coordinates of the bounding box in files. And these files will be the ones that uh, the deep learning model will use to train. This is a manual task that the researchers need to do. But in each of the frames, we may have more than one peak, maybe 10, maybe hundreds. So at the end, we uh, are generating uh, 1,800 bounding boxes again. And this is only for a one minute video. In reality, we have uh, thousands of hours of recording. So this results in thousands of hours of manual work, which is very tedious. Here I'm going to summarize the problems that I explained so far. Uh, animal behavior is difficult to analyze. We produce hundreds of gigabytes to terabytes per day. This data must be accessible to everyone in the, in the project, and the data must be annotated. Uh, this is the reference architecture uh, that I received when I started the, the project. This is the result of my predecessor, Manu Agarwal, another PDN, on his project, a digital platform for behavioral phenotyping. This is a layer architect, a microservice layer architecture that is needed to process the uh, high complex heterogeneous data that these agri-food uh, pro projects have. You can see some of the layers, and each of the layers have a, a function, a service that they need to produce. Manu is continuing with this uh, research as a PhD, and he will work to realize this platform for agri-food projects during four years, but in the meantime, Imagine needs some solutions to continue the research. They cannot wait for four years. So in my project, I decided to realize some of these uh, layers to, in order that they can already use them. So I decided to focus on a data sharing solution, a data annotating solution, and data analytics. Now I'm going to explain to you the final solutions that I propose, because I don't have time to go over all the iterations. For the data sharing, we are using Research Drive, which is a, a, data, a research collaboration-oriented storage tool. It's provided by TOE and SORFSARA from yeah, the Dutch um, ICT provider. And we got 11 terabytes for free. This tool is accessible for everyone, not only for the people from the TOE, but also for the companies. And this was a very important requirement. And it's simple to use. It's just like a drive with folders where the people can upload and download the data. Of course, it has limitations. This is not uh, ready for long-term storage. Uh, the TOE is a data donor, and this can have problems in case of TOE, uh, uh, when the TOE finishes the, the research, what happens with the data. And if we want to obtain extra space, it's expensive. So the researchers had to come to an agreement of which relevant data must be stored. You cannot store all the data in the cloud because the costs are impossible. And this is the provided solution for the data sharing. On the data annotation, uh, we use CBAT tool, computer vision annotation tool. And this was something that the researchers were using on their local machines. But what we provided is a, a virtual what we provided is a virtual machine with, that hosts this, this tool. Here you can see a, a video, a GIF of how the tool works. Basically, it has a graphic, graphical interface where you upload your scenes, and you can uh, draw the, the bounding box, and this tool automatically produces the, the files that you need to train the deep learning models. Since this tool is now hosted in a virtual machine, uh, everyone in the project can have access to the same data, and this it helps a lot. It's still, it's still ha, it still has some manual work, but at least they can work together in the same, in the same data. And this allows Imagine to hire or to uh, yeah, get some master students to annotate the data, which increase their annotation speed by quite a lot. And if you recall this slide, uh, I was talking about some complex data and some intermediate steps for the behavioral analysis to be performed. So for this, I propose my data pipeline called Insight. 
and I'm going to explain you how it works with some example. Well, these are the goals of Insight. Uh, Insight wants to process AI-generated data into understandable data. It wants to aid the researchers uh, with behavioral analysis by providing, to, by finding patterns, performing analytics, and detecting simple behavior. I'm going to explain you where Insight is located inside of the imaging program. If you remember, we produce the data in the farms, and this is the input data that we get from Bormer and Utrecht. Then this data is annotated by all the members of Imagine from all the research groups, and the research group of Eindhoven produces the deep learning models. And with these deep learning models, we obtain AI-generated data that will be used by my pipeline at the end. I'm going to explain you briefly how the input data uh, works and how it is. So imagine again that we have a one-minute video. This video is divided in 30 frames. And when, the, when we apply the deep learning models, this is the kind of data that the behavioral researchers would get. As you can see, it's, uh, yeah, it's full of numbers. So for behavioral researchers, non-technical people, this will be hard to understand. In this data, you can see in the first column the, the number of the frames that uh, we are analyzing. The, the second column is the IDs. It represents the ID of the animals, the pigs or the chickens. And the, the remaining four columns are the coordinates of the bounding box. And this is the starting point of, this is the, starting point of the insight. So I got this data, and my first idea was, OK, what can I obtain with this data? My starting point was to obtain the animal trajectories. This is one example that I created with fabricated data before I got access to the project data. And here you can see trajectories of the animals. In different colors are different animals. And the initial position is marked with a red dot, and the last position is marked with a black star. But when you start, when you try to use this data with uh, real data, the graph becomes messy because there are so many animals and they move quite a lot. And in this example, there are only 11 animals, but in real life, you could have hundreds of animals, so you will see nothing. So my next step was to superpose these trajectories in a live video. And you can see. Uh, yeah, here you can see the trajectories being plotted on top of the animals. So it provides you a better sense of what the, what the specific animal is doing. And this was a nice starting point. Of course, if you don't want to analyze all the animals and you only want to analyze specific animals, uh, it can be configured to only track these animals. In this other example, only the, the pigs 1, 3, 5, and 7 are being followed. Another important uh, feature that we can analyze with Insight is the distance travel. And uh, in this plot, you can see the, in the, the columns are the different peaks, and the vertical distance is the distance travel in pixels. And this is useful to understand the animal activity. And it's, a, it's something that the, the breeders use because they want to calculate the feeding efficiency. A, a pig or a chicken that moves more it will consume more food to, in order to grow. And it's something that yeah, they want to measure. Another important feature in order to analyze behavior is the proximity. And how I measure it, uh, I create a, a symmetrical matrix where I compare uh, the proximity between pairs of animals. I measure the distance between them as a Euclidean distance. And I, I compare this distance with a threshold. If the distance between two animals is below a threshold, they are counted as an interaction. And of course, we can configure the, the searching radius to measure these things. It has, there are some problems with the measures of the, uh, with the distance. This, mes this distance is only measured one per frame. So if the animal moves more or after the frame happens, it, it won't be captured. And these distances are measured in camera perspective. We measure the distance in pixels. But this, again, this could be changed uh, by using the AI. They could uh, make the, the conversion from pixel distance to real world distance. This uh, proximity matrix can be visualized as a heat map plot. And yeah, the way of reading this heat map plot is in, in the rows and the columns are different peaks. And in the place where they intersect, uh, you can see the number of frames. They are close together. So in, for example, uh, for a 120 radius, 
you can see that the peak uh, 559, if you go to where they intersect, they were together 22 frames. And for the 7 and the, and the 6, they were together uh, 9 frames. This matrix has complete one-on-one uh, -on -one information about what the animals are doing. Uh, so that is good in order to see which animals are more close to each other. But we are missing some context. We don't know if the animals are sitting, moving, or what are they doing. So uh, in order to brief, give some context, I try to define some animal activities, some animal states. And I do it by uh, calculating the average velocity of the animals. Uh, I sort this array. And I produce some uh, statistical features like the, the quartiles. The animals that are placed in the, in the first quartile will be marked as passive. The ones from the first to the third will be marked as active. And the, the, the rest will be very active. In this example, uh, they will be placed like this. So now that we have the proximity matrix and we have the, the animal states, I produce a social network that you can see here. In this social network, there are some, some nodes, which are the circles and some edges that connect the circles that with yeah, the edges. So these nodes are colored in, in different, uh, they are colored based on the activity of the peaks. The very active are the, are the red ones, the active are the green ones, the passive are the grays, and the, the peaks eating are the blue. And the edges between them are also colored based on the amount of contact that they have in the scene. So you can see that if they have a large contact, they have a, a, a red edge. And if they have a, a medium, have a, have a yellow uh, edge. And the uh, small contacts have a, a green edge. And this social network is easy to visualize, which is a, a plus for the non-technical people. But this information is only qualitative. And what I mean on, on this is that the individual states are defined based on the global states. So if, we, if you have a, a group of peaks and all of them are very active, it will be very hard to, understand, to differentiate between active or passive. But this model works very well when you have a big pen that has all the kind of states. Uh, here, I, I also plot the eating information. But right now, this can only be done if you uh, yeah, manually uh, at the coordinates of the feeding station, but this could be improved in the future with the help of AI. They could also detect the feeding station. Uh, if you want to have more concrete information about what the animals do uh, during the scene, I also produce these uh, state diagrams where you can see the percentage of the time of in, in the scene where the animals spend doing something. So, for example, you can see that the pig number 10 is eating all the time, and the pig nine is sitting all the time, while other pigs uh, yeah, spend half time uh, eating or, or sitting and moving. And this is nice because you have an overview of the pen, but still you are missing some uh, time information. You, you know that some pigs are spending half of the time doing something, but you don't know how. So for that, I also produce this timeline uh, state diagram where uh, each of these graphs represents a different peak, and you can see how they behave uh, on, on each frame. So for example, the peak number seven is sitting uh, from for some frames, then moves a bit, sits, and yeah, you can see the rest. And of course, our hungry peak is still eating all the time. <laughs> and here you can see some concrete behavior, but of course, it depends on the state definition. So this should be. Uh, yeah, better fine-tuned by the behavioral experts. Here I'm going to present the, the solution for what I did for my, my PDM project. I provided a data setting solution, a data annotation solution, and a data analytics solution inside that helps understanding, analyze data, obtain features such as distance, velocities, proximities, and trajectories, performs simple behavioral analysis, and makes research easier. I also have some recommendations for insight. I know what they are working on, so it's a bit of cheating. But now what they are doing is trying to analyze complex behavior and genetic information. Instead of only using computer vision to, to detect the animals, they want to detect the interactions. Of course, this is very complex, but they are working on it. 
And to detect the interventions, yeah, we are brainstorming what can we do. So for example, we could detect the head of the tail, so you can yeah, see when the, the tail of a, a pig is getting close to another, uh, to the head or the tail of another pig. We can also detect the interventions, classify them, or describe them. And once we have these behavioral-based uh, analytics, we can, we can include them in sight. And the end goal of the project, which is a bit far away, is to link this behavior to genomics. But when they do that, this genomic analytics could be included in the insight. Of course, they also need to improve the, the storage uh, solution. Right now, we have a working solution, which is a temporal solution. But as I mentioned, Manu and other people of insight, we call up and collaborators from HPC Lab and TUE and the Sorsara and Asteran, they are working on a long-term solution where they can they can st uh, store and archive and share the data. Oh, the same for the models. And in this, store, in this platform, they can also integrate analytics, for example, Insight. This platform uh, is being developed not only by Imagine, but other collaborating projects which are similar to Images, for example, Smart Turkeys. Uh, sorry, Smart Turkeys. <laughs> and the last recommendation is related to the data. What Imagine wants to do is, um, well, another AI project is move from a model-oriented approach to a data-oriented approach. Uh, a very important concern is of imaging is how much time it takes to annotate the data, and they want to have a way of automatically annotating the data. And of course, this is very challenging. They want to try some self-supervised learning, uh, which are some unsupervised uh, learning methods that they can combine unlabeled data with previously uh, labeled data in order that the algorithm automatically works with, without having to annotate the data. And this is in the future, of course, and yeah, it's a state-of-the-art computer vision. And well, I have some acknowledgement to the people who helped me to finalize uh, this project. Of course, my supervisors who could not join here, Janja and Desiree, who helped me a lot these two years. The, the Imagine team, I'm also very thankful to them. My PD coaches, my PDN colleagues, and Christina. And yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Luis. So, questions? I see several hands. Jorge and then Tom. Yeah. Jorge. Coming. Save my life. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Luis. Quite insightful. Uh, out of curiosity, I have a question that perhaps is a little bit out of place. I apologize for that in advance. Uh, I see that. Uh, this, this preserve project, uh, Imagine, is a uh, very state of the art uh, where they are trying to apply all kind of uh, futuristic uh, technologies to improve the, the way of uh, living of these uh, animals. Hmm. Then, uh, out of curiosity, how do we compare this approach to improve uh, the, the way of living of animals to just uh, increasing uh, the farms where they live? You just uh, out of curiosity, will, will this uh, help the companies? Will they, this help uh, uh, us as, as humans, the animals? Mm. Yes, so of course the, yeah, the, there are companies involved in these projects with, who found them and, and yeah, they are interesting. They have some company interest. But the original idea was that uh, just increasing the capacity of the farms or just adding more animals into the farm, that is not sustainable in the long term because at the end, the, the Earth has some limited resources. So, um, and the breeding companies, they lose a significant percentage of animals uh, yearly because these animals, yeah, on the case of the pigs, they may, may hurt on the, on the tails, and that might not be lethal, but on the case of the chickens, so, yeah, a lot of chickens may die because of these injuries. And I think the, the percentage of, of animals that they have to, yeah, to cool, to sacrifice, each year is around 10%. So that is already a, a significant economic impact for the companies. So what they want to have, uh, or they want to breed animals that they react better to these, to these uh, stressful situations. So in this sense, when you have better animals and they live happier, they, they produce more, uh, the, the laying hens produce more eggs and, and so. so 
Instead of wanting to grow horizontally, increasing the number of animals, they want to grow what they call vertically, increasing the quality of the animals. So I think this answers your question. I don't know if it's clear or not, but oh. this is how the project wants to impact on the life of the animals and also in the, in the pockets of the farmers. It is clear. Thank you. Tom? Nice presentation. Thank you, Tom. Um, you're building, you're trying to understand the, the, the social uh, behavior of the, of the animals and uh, try to construct a social network. Um, you said that proximity is really a, an important indicator to, to see how the animals uh, relate uh, mm -hmm. to each other. So I was wondering, um, so currently you actually uh, uh, calculated the distances based on, on the pixels, so mm -hmm. the, the picture. Did you also take a look at real distances and did you take into account, for example, lens distortion and perspective of the camera? Because that makes a big difference. Uh, I didn't do it, but we discussed it in multiple brainstorm sessions. So, as you can imagine, understanding the social interaction of the animals is a qualitative science, it's not very exact. So, in these first steps of the project, uh, using the pixel is okay. But this is something that is uh, being discussed because the cameras, for example, they, are, they provide a tilted perspective, so it may be more complex to understand from a 2D image if two animals are close to each other. So they, of course they are working on that, the people from the computer vision department, they are the ones who are more in charge on this. But what I know is that they can easily transform pixel-based units into real-world units by placing some markets in the images. And if you know the distance in real-world of the markets and you get the image, the distance in the image, you can uh, yeah, transform easily. And they are also doing something that is, is very cool. Uh, in the pens, we have two cameras which are uh, perpendicular to each other, and they obtain data from the two cameras. And what they are doing is combining the image of these two cameras, like from the two perpendicular images, trying to create a virtual image that is the, the product of these two. And this also helps uh, to produce the real world data, because the, it's like a virtual image that has the, all the information of the two perpendicular images. And this helps you with the, with the deep of the image. Because if you only have one image, it's, it's like if you are with one eye, you, you cannot see distances. So they are, they are working on it. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, nice presentation and interesting topic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a question uh, uh, related to ethic, ethics. Uh, mm -hmm. Since the project involves uh, live animals, uh, were there any ethical aspects involved in the project? And uh, did you have to take any ethical approvals uh, for mm -hmm. the project? Yeah. yeah. So, well, in this project, uh, I learned a lot about these topics because they are very far away from my background. I visit the farms so many times, and I, I work uh, nearby the, the PSD researchers. So, for example, I know that the, 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 PSD, that the, the PSD students that they are working on, the, for example, in the chicken project, they also need to learn about ethics, and, and they also produce papers on the ethics, only because we can uh, breed animals that are, that are more, yeah, better animals in our eyes. That doesn't mean that it's ethical, so they also think about that. In my project, uh, I am not so close to the ethics part, but I was happy to see that this, that is something that is discussed by these people. So they, 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 they Behavioral researchers, the animals, they really care about the animals. So, of course, we want to improve their lives, but for us it's also an economical aspect. But these people really care about the animals, so I think they really care about the ethics. Okay. So yeah. that is yeah, covered. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Mm. I don't think I have it here. Do, do I have still time for a question or not? Okay, uh, we can have uh, uh, two more questions, including my last question. So go ahead. Yes, Hans. Yeah, yeah, so I was wondering there, um, a good presentation, by the way, and a very interesting uh, subject. Uh, the, for me, um, all pigs look the same. 
Yeah, so I was wondering, is image recognition is the best uh, technology uh, to identif identify the location? Or did you also consider other technologies uh, to, uh, to distinguish uh, which pig we are talking about? Uh, and, and maybe that's even worse for, uh, for chickens. Yeah, it's a very complex topic. We, we are not the only research group that is working on this. And uh, to be honest, the algorithms there are still on development. They are not perfect. What we have in, in most of well, not most of the cases, in some minor cases, we have ID switches. The bounding box, they have some ID, one number that is identified to the animal. And maybe in some scenes, two animals get very close or, or one of the animals goes in front of the other and the switches are changed. So one animal that was the number one gets the two and the other way around. They are only using deep learning. And the main reason is because on the farms, uh, they have hundreds of animals, and they want. If you want to, if you want to uh, check this behavior and even predict it or stop it, you have to be looking at hundreds of thousands of animals. So they just want something automatically. In this case, deep learning. I don't know if they consider another technology, but this is the the one that most of the research groups and the state of the art groups are are trying to use. Uh, in the case, in, in some other projects, I know that they mark the animals with uh, paint on their, on their bodies, but the, the algorithms that they are developing in, in imaging is only, um, they don't care about these markers. Uh, they even prefer to not have them, because otherwise your algorithm can be biased to only recognize pigs with paint on their body. So, so far they are working only on deep learning technology. I have co-supervised Louis, so I want to add to that. Um, so other researchers are also aware about the state of the art technologies are being developed, for example, in China, the surveillance. They don't only look at the animals, also their citizens they look at. So um, we also are aware about the technologies they're using um, as well. Um, so before we go on to the lunch, maybe you can show the photo of your visit to yeah, Utrecht Farm. Do you, you don't have it? Oh, it's busy. <laughs> so I also want to say that um, this was a nice project. Uh, so since 2018, we have been contributing not only to the um, innovation in high-tech industry, but also in the agriculture, agri-tech uh, field. Uh, so we get to work with behavioral scientists in um, uh, who help the well-being of the animals, uh, including smart turkeys, chicken, and uh, pigs. So we are very happy to expand our scope in our program. And I also want to point out that Luis has won uh, his team. Actually, he has led a team of, uh, of students um, in the university during his graduation project for the CERN hackathon, and even got invited to do a PhD in uh, CERN in Geneva. Um, but I think you are going to join ASML. <laughs> <laughs> so CERN was quite upset about uh, that choice. But I think uh, uh, it helped you to expand to work with uh, mm. the behavioral scientists and also mm. in this field, right? So thank you again. We're going to have a lunch um, now. Uh, in the same place, in Forhof, and we should be back at uh, one, so I invite you all to be back five minutes or three minutes before one to be able to start our, our time, okay? So enjoy your lunch. Thank you again.
Okay, so welcome back uh, to the Expo Symposium. We are starting now the second phase of the Expo Symposium. Our first speaker is Raha Sadehi, who has done her project at the uh, ASML and going to talk about the feasibility analysis and prototype of uh, commercial uh, off the shelf pattern recognition. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yanja. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Raha Sadeghi, and I have done my project with the title of Feasibility and Prototype of Replacing Commercial of the Shelf Pattern Recognition Solution at ASML. In today's presentation, I would like to start by uh, giving the context of the project, then I will define what was the problem, how we tried to address it, the proposed design and architecture, and finally, I can share some of the verification and validation results and end this presentation by giving a summary on the achievements in this project. Okay, as you might know, ASML is one of the leading company in building lithography tools. And lithography in the context of semiconductor is nothing but exposing lights on the silicon wafer to create some structures on that. ASML has delivered a proven holistic lithography solution more than 10 years ago, involving scanners, metrology, and computational lithography to maximize the patterning process performance and control. Twin scan as a scanner enables or starts the uh, lithography solution. Afterwards, metrology and computational lithography together provide some feedbacks to twin scan such that it can compensate its error for the next batch of the wafers. Yield Star is one of the metrology machines within ASML, which enables measuring quality metrics such as, uh, such as uh, I'm sorry, such as, uh, fo uh, such as focus and overlay. And in this way, uh, this information can be used to provide some feedbacks to scanners. In order to understand what is happening within Yield Star, let's have a look at the life cycle of the wafer in Yield Star. Initially, a wafer should be picked from the, uh, from the FOOP, which is a box of the scanned wafer. Later on, um, the point is that Yield Star can only measure the wafer if it knows the exact position of the structures on the wafer. It knows the estimated position. However, the fact is that once the wafer is located on the stage, it's prone to some extent of rotation, translation, or transformation. Therefore, it needs first to align, uh, it needs to go to the wafer alignment phase and update its coordinate system. And wafer alignment can be done using pattern recognition. But the question is that how pattern recognition can help at this stage? Let's have a look here. Suppose this is the wafer surface. We can uh, split the wafer surface into many different fields. There should be a, uh, we expect to see almost the same set of structures within each of these fields. There should be at least one unique stru uh, structure, like this one, which they call it GA marks, within uh, all these structures, which yield start take advantage of that, run pattern recognition, and try to localize this pattern within the input image. So in this way, it can find the exact position. As I mentioned, it knows the estimated position. So it can find the shifts between the estimated positions. Uh, and if Yield Star repeats this procedure for enough number of marks or fields, say four in the edge cases, the green ones, and two in the center, then it can create a high order wafer model and update its coordinate systems. So what was the problem? Currently, pattern recognition is being done using a commercial tool which is called Cognex, and actually it does its job quite well. However, this library is quite expensive. Each license costs around 3.5 Ks, and uh, there are, uh, each machine requires a separate license. There are more than 600 machines, and uh, this, uh, the number of the machines are growing. And also, Cognex doesn't work without a hardware dongle, which this dongle could make even the configuration more complex. For instance, there are different versions of the Cognex. Each version has its own dongle, and uh, developers uh, should, and, uh, should be able to support all different versions. And finally, also, it is important to mention, because it's a commercial tool, so the whole solution is being used as a black box, and making any changes on that is not possible. Therefore, this project was initiated by ASML to investigate on the feasibility of replacing Cognex with an in-house solution, maybe by taking advantage of free and open source libraries that we created this library and we called it RECOG. Let me explain that Cognex supports two different types of the patterns. Patterns could be image-based, which in this case, the pattern can be cropped from the input image or it can be model-based. In this case, the model and its geometric shapes can be described by just some set of uh, lines. 
And in this project, due to the time limit, we only focus on the model-based patterns, and we had some reasons for that. First of all, model-based patterns seems to be used more accurately. Uh, I mean, the results are more accurate, and uh, it seems that they are being used uh, uh, more, and they are more common. And also, we believe that if we could address model-based pattern recognition, extending the solution to address image-based pattern recognition shouldn't be a big deal. There is a tool called APT. It's a kind of wrapper around the Cognex, and users can run and run pattern recognition using that. Because the first goal was to uh, replace the Cognex, so also we needed to think about a replacement for APT. We created the similar tool with almost the same functionalities, and we called it ART. And finally, as the third goal and the last goal in this project, we wanted to integrate RECOG into the Yield Star, first, to show the feasibility of this integration, and second, to be able to measure uh, the quality and accuracy and performance of the RECOG. These are the main criteria or uh, concerns that we considered while proposing the new solutions. First of all, the accuracy of this solution was highly important. Any, this solution should also be able to recognize and localize the pattern with sub-pixel accuracy. Of course, performance was important. Any latency at this stage means latency in the measurement phase, and also it could uh, lead to an overhead in the lithography solutions. It should be easy for customers to migrate to the new solutions. They already created some recipes based on the Cognex, and recreating a new one could be really hard and time consuming. And of course, this, uh, and also the flexibility of the solution was important. Because different images might have different contrast, brightness, they might be noisy, and also the same pattern might look like different on different layers of the wafer, depending on the photoresist material that is being used in each of these layers. And finally, because it was the first step toward replacing the Cognex, the extensibility of the solution was also important. Let's discuss about the proposed design and architecture. And I would like to start with the process view and explain what was the main idea of this uh, proposed algorithm for pattern recognition. RECOG has two different phases. The first step is training, which we try to extract some features and attributes from the, input, uh, from the pattern and recognition phase, which based on the recognized, uh, I mean, which based on the extracted feature, the template, the input uh, image, and runtime parameters, we try to recognize and localize the pattern. Let's focus at the training phase. As I've mentioned, we are dealing with the model-based pattern. So what we have could be only a simple XML file, which we also extracted this file, I mean, this information, description of the lines from the files created using Cognex. So as a first step, we had to visualize this pattern. If needed, based on the user preferences, we could rescale it. And, we re uh, and based on the experiments, we realized that contours are the most important or useful uh, attributes that can be extracted. And contour is just like a curve joining all the continuous points along the boundary, these rule lines. Uh, so, we, what we extract is the number of the contours, the minimum area, and the maximum area of the contours of the template. We save this information, and I will explain how we can use this information in next slides. Recognition phase has four different steps. The first step is image pre-processing. The goal is to adjust the contrast of the image or remove some noises and create a mask. What is the mask and how it can be used, I will explain in the next slide. Then we go to the course recognition, which the goal is to see if we can recognize the pattern and if yes, what is it, pixel-based positions. This can be done using edge detection, applying the mask, and template matching. Template matching is an image processing technique, uh, or I mean pattern recognition technique, uh, which is uh, intensity-based. If we can recognize the pattern at this stage, uh, then we need to make sure how accurate the result was. Was it a false detection, or how accurate it was? This can be done by comparing the intensity and the number of the contours of the template and also the input image, or the recognized region. And if the score calculated at this stage is above the threshold specified by the user, then we go to the last stage, which is fine recognition, and uh, we try to localize the pattern with sub-pixel accuracy using mainly interpolation. So, what was the mask? By creating the mask, the main goal is to highlight those areas in the input image which the possibility of finding the pattern there is quite high. 
And uh, in this way, we can try to remove some noises and also uh, minimize the risk of ending up with false detection. This can be done by thresholding and converting image into the binary format and then try to find the contours. Uh, in this way, we try to find all different shapes in the input image. Now it's time to have a look at the training information that we said previously. In this way, we can, using this information, we can select only those contours which has more or less the same attributes as the, uh, as the template. And using the selected contours, we can create the mask. Let's go to the next stage. During the course recognition, as I mentioned, we have to first select, uh, I mean, detect the edges. We are using template matching. We just want to convert the image also into some set of lines. We can dilate it to increase the intensity and also collect those corners uh, that might be detached. And finally, we apply the mask because we are not interested in all these edges. Some of them might be the result of the noises and so on. So we change the reference image uh, and this input image to this reference image, and now we are ready to convolute the pattern across this input image and try to localize the pattern. Now that you know the main idea behind the proposed algorithm, let's also have a look at the logical view of our architecture and let's see how we try to address other concerns such as extensibility of the solutions. We can review the architecture of RECOG from different points of view. Let's only focus on the recognition and I can explain two most important points about that. RECOG tool can be considered in, from this point of view the main class, which has uh, the ownership of the pattern, runtime parameters, recognition results, image, uh, input image, and so on. So it's uh, the whole solution. But we decided to, based on the strategy, to encapsulate the recognition algorithm into a separate uh, interface. And in this way, the extensibility of the solutions should be easy, and users can easily switch into the different algorithms. And uh, that was one of the things that we considered. Moreover, during the recognition algorithm, and also, for instance, during the training and so on, we take advantage of some image processing techniques. Uh, so we decided also to introduce an image processing uh, interface, and currently this interface has been implemented using OpenCV Sharp, which is um, a free and open source library. However, in the future, this can be implemented by other libraries as well, and the solution is not dependent to this library. What was ART? It was the replacement for the APT, if you can remember. Using this tool, uh, this is the new tool, the new replacement of the APT, users can play around, run, uh, try, uh, I mean, try different runtime parameters, run pattern recognition, and once they are satisfied with the results, they can create an alignment profile. They can create batch pattern recognition, and also we added a new feature to this tool, which based on that, users can convert the files created using Cognex into a new format, which is readable by record. And in this way, we try to smooth the migration into the new library. That was the user interface of the APT, the previous tool, and this is the user interface of the new tool, ART. As you can see there, uh, as it can be seen, they are quite similar. And that was intentionally such that users feel the same experience while using with this tool. Let's also discuss about the architecture of the ART. We decided to use MVVM architecture or pattern to separate the concerns into different layers. And while the view layer is only deal with uh, how the UI should look like and view model uh, responsible for presentation logic, the model layer uh, is responsible for business logic and data. And in this case, it's only or mainly uh, the single tone instance of the RECOG, the library that we uh, proposed because we were dealing with a singleton instance, so there was, for some times there was a, a need for communication between different view models. To address the, this communication, we decided to use Messenger, which is an implementation of the mediator, and in this way, different view models can communicate with each other through the Messenger, and they are not anymore tightly coupled to each other. Uh, it's, it's a long topic to discuss about how we made this integration of the record into the yield list are possible, but really shortly, and briefly, that was the uh, um, high-level um, architecture of the wafer alignment before initiating this project. As you can see, they already proposed a pattern recognition wrapper, and the other modules and components just know about these interfaces. So they are not uh, coupled to the, how it has been implemented. 
what, we extended this architecture. We proposed RECOG, which was based on the OpenCV Shark. And, uh, we did, uh, and also we created a new tool, ART, we discussed. And so for making this integration, the least thing that we had to do was to implement these interfaces based on the RECOG. Let's discuss about how we verify or validate our proposed algorithm. Uh, the test can be divided into main phases, the test on the local system and the test on the machine. Let us start with the local test. Uh, for the test on the local uh, system, the main goal was to check the accuracy and, uh, and uh, robustness of the solution. So apart from unit test, integration test, and attempt for creating ground truth data, we mainly focus on testing against real images taken while doing a wafer alignment on the machines. So we ran batch pattern recognition using RECOG, the new library, and we ran batch pattern recognition using Cognext available library, and we compared these results. Uh, we repeated this procedure for different patterns and also the same pattern, but on different layers of the wafer to check its robustness as well. For instance, the, one of these uh, patterns was two a square one. You can see uh, a two a square pattern here. And as you can see, it is available in all these images. These are four different images uh, that, for instance, we use for pattern recognition. And as, you can, uh, and as it can be seen, there might be noisy, there might be blurry, there might be shadow, and so on. This is the, uh, let me explain the first figure, because the rest of the figures are quite similar. For instance, uh, you can see here, in the x-axis, you see different images. For instance, we had 75 different images with two square pattern. And in the y-axis, you see the offset value in x, or offset value in y in the next slide, uh, measured or reported by RECOG, the blue ones, or Cognex, the orange ones. And I, I tried to set each unit in the y-axis as one pixel, such that we can see the difference in a pixel basis easily. The one, and as, uh, as it can be seen, mainly the difference was less than one pixel, and that was the requirement or concerns of the stakeholders. And also in a y-axis for two square pattern, still we see that the difference is mainly less than one pixel. This is for another pattern called H++H, and on a layer, let's say layer D. As it can be seen, sometimes this, uh, some images were too dark or too noisy and so on. This is the result. Uh, still, not only the difference are mainly less than one pixel, but also there are some cases that RECOG outperformed Cognex because there were cases that RECOG were able to recognize the pattern, which it was not easy by Cognex. And in a y-axis for the same pattern, for instance, for this specific case, we see that there was a big gap uh, because the result reported by Cognex was quite far from the rest, we can conclude that that was an um, a inaccurate result reported by Cognex. And for the same pattern, but on a different layer, layer P, just to check the robustness, and let's see the results. Mainly the difference is still less than one pixel. And in a y-axis, we see that it's almost less than one pixel except some cases, for instance, this one. So let's have a look at this image. That was the input image. And as, you, uh, as it can be seen, it's a little bit noisy. And this is the new perspective that we added into the ART. Within ART, uh, in this case, the orange lines, I don't know if it's clear here or not, or the, these orange lines are the template. And the rest is just uh, is that we uh, crop the recognized region based on the report, uh, offset value reported by RECOG. And uh, it seems that the results uh, based on the record uh, values are quite accurate. So we can conclude that maybe the results uh, reported by the uh, record are more accurate in this case also as Cognex. Finally, we also did some tests on the machines just to validate this, uh, the, uh, the accuracy, I mean, everything about the solution. Uh, if you can remember, the final goal with Yield Star was to measure some wafers. So what we did is that we integrated the solution into the Yield Star and we used some recipes to, uh, to measure the wafers. During the measurement phase, we have to align the wafers. For alignment phase, uh, we use uh, mainly RECOG and also we did it with Cognex and we checked the robustness, accuracy, performance of our solution against the KPIs available in Yield Star based on the specifications which are available. The first KPI was total measurement uncertainty. This is, uh, uh, this is more about the precision or how stable the results are. So if you repeat this uh, measurement phase multiple times and you get the similar results, then this value should be better. 
Based on the specifications, TMU in X and Y should be less than 0.22 nanometers. And that was the case for both Cognex and Recog. And even if you notice, uh, these values are quite close to each other. The next KPI was matching. Matching uh, is about accuracy of the system. So we, we can compare uh, one value to a reference value. And in this, in this case, the reference value was something which was acceptable by uh, the company. So based on these specifications, mean X and mean Y was less than 0 0.07, and uh, I mean should be less than uh, 0 0.07, and record met these specifications. And also three sigma, which is another a statistical uh, parameter should be less than 0 0.17, and also RECOG met this one. About its throughput and performance, we realized that RECOG is 4% slower than Cognex, but still it met the specifications, because based on the specification, fast wafer alignment should be done in less than two seconds, and RECOG in 1.8 seconds in a worst case scenario can meet this specification as well. Finally, so we proposed a new library by taking advantage of the free and open source libraries, and there is no need for hardware dongle. And so we can also help in reducing the cost in the company. And also we created a similar tool. And let's have a look at the uh, concerns that we had at the start of this project. The first one was accuracy, and we showed that we were able to uh, I mean, localize the pattern using RECOG accurately. We, uh, we, we have seen that the performance of this record was 4% slower, but it still meet the, met the specifications. We proved the flexibility by testing it against different patterns and also different layers of the same pattern. And uh, also we try by creating, uh, by adding new features to the tool, and also creating the user, I mean similar user interface, we try to address the ease of use concern of the customers. For, as a recommendation for future work, although we tested the solution quite extensively, but we still believe it's good to continue testing the solution against different patterns, and also uh, definitely the solution should be extended to support image-based pattern recognition. And uh, because pattern recognition has application in other modules, not only in wafer alignment, but also, for instance, in sensing and so on, so the solution can be extended to be used as a unified solution for the yield star. Thank you very much for listening to me. And is there, if there is any question, I have it. Thank you, Raha. So, okay. I see several hands. Uh, go ahead, Jorge. Once again. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Raha. Uh, quite an awesome presentation. Uh, quite proud of uh, all the hard work you did. I can see that there. Uh, and I have a question regarding your, uh, um, how can I say, future work. Uh, you mentioned uh, image-based pattern recognition can be used. You also mentioned that uh, that's, that can be possible based on the work you have done. My question is, uh, how much improvement do you think uh, GILSTAR can get by implementing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest, uh, the, mm, right now if you notice, I don't know if you remember or not, but uh, during the training phase what we did is that we tried to visualize the pattern. So finally we just converted it into an image format. But the only good point about using this model is that when you visualize it, you have these lines really straight and everything is clear. But when you have the images, and because, uh, the, as I also mentioned, uh, we're using mainly uh, template matching with the intensity of the images might be different, so the patterns depending on the material that is being used. Uh, so um, the first step is that, I mean, first of all, it's just like some changes into the training phase, and it's like uh, they have to try to detect the edges and converting also this image into a set of lines, and if the quality of the image is good enough to all, uh, that they can detect all these edges quite accurately, then I think from uh, that point, the rest would be the same. So making these changes is, could be only related to the training phase, and maybe they can add just like a prerequisite that for this one, they have to try to use a better uh, images, the images that the quality are better. Afterwards, it should be easy. At least this is the first think that, uh, I mean, the first uh, idea that I have. 
Okay. Thank you. We have room for one more question. I'm just looking at it. Yeah, Han. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you for the presentation, uh, and it looks like an excellent result in a, in a limited uh, time. I was just wondering, because it's, it looks like so complete, uh, including the testing and the verification, if you would have had a little bit of bad luck uh, and you were short in time, what would you have left out? Mm, if I didn't have shortages of time? No, if you have now, you finished now in time, but if you had some bad luck and it took a little bit longer and you, were, you fell short of time, what would you have left out? Yeah, um, of course, one of the things that I would have done is that I will continue and extend the solution to support the image-based pattern recognition, I mean the image-based one, and also we were working on the improving the performance. Uh, the first time the performance was something like 22% slower than the uh, Cognex one, so we tried to improve the performance, and still we had some idea that how it could be improved. Uh, so it was like if you had time, of course I would have continued. And also I got some feedbacks after the presentation for the ASML on how to extend the solution for sensing and so on. And uh, they were not really a big deal. These are the things that could be addressed. But the main thing before making this uh, really possible and in a production level mode is that they have to really change the recipes because they are mainly based on the Cognex. And uh, this is something that I think takes the most of the time. So it's like I should have something like at least like another t um, um, uh, project, training project to complete this project and make it uh, in a production level. Yeah, so let me try to summarize. So if you would have had a bit of bad luck, you would probably not have done the performance improvement and maybe not all the Less, recipes yes. that there. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because we spend lots of time on testing. So you had possibilities to do uh, to make variation in your scope. Yeah, but that was Very the good. main uh, concern yeah. for them. Yeah, good. I have a follow-up question also on that. So on the performance, at the end it was quite close uh, to the Cognex one. Huh? So uh, in your case, have you also done the profiling of your uh, modules uh, to see at the end which uh, modules or which subsystems were causing the performance? The initial? performance yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did the same. I mean, uh, even for improving the performance, we did first the uh, profiling and we just find out what is the bottleneck. We try to improve that one. Uh, but for the rest, I think um, still still we had some idea. Maybe it was related to the fact that how we can uh, just, uh, about the interpolation phase, it took some time and we can just move it into the training phase. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Raha. So You're let's uh, give another round of applause. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Tom Franken. Um, he has done his uh, final project at uh, Philips uh, Research. Also his supervisor, co-supervisor from the TU is in attendance here, Jerry. And probably you have noticed. So I have was also a co-supervisor of Tom's project. It was a pleasure to work with Tom and Jerry for the first time <laughs> without having the fights. <laughs> without having the fights, with an excellent result, and Philips has um, uh, been very proud of the result. They even made an offer to let uh, Tom join. I'm not sure if it's a secret, but um, I think he's joining Philips also after graduating. So, floor, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Is it, is it working? Yeah. It's working. Nice. Well, um, a warm wel welcome to everyone, um, also the people at home. I don't know which camera I have to look, but uh, the online uh, visitors. Are you all enjoying the show? All enjoying the program? <laughs> nice. All right. Um, well, my name is Tom Franke. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I did my project uh, at Royal Philips. Um, um, uh, for the, the, the ones that don't know Philips, Philips is uh, a, a leading company in, uh, in healthcare and uh, well being. Um, they're actually from Eindhoven. I'm also from Eindhoven. It's a, it's a nice place to be, to study, and to work. Um, so my project was about healthcare. The topics that I would like to address are the following. First, uh, sketch a bit of context. Then uh, go into the problem description, show my system design, um, look back at what we achieved, uh, and then there is room for some questions. And unfortunately, due to confidentiality, uh, I'm not able to go really in depth into the technical design. But nevertheless, uh, I hope this will be an interesting story. And of course, uh, uh, you're free to ask questions. So let's look at the context. 
Digitalization in healthcare. Well, in general, we are living in a digital world. We are always on, responsive, customer-centric. We were always walking around with our mobile phones. Uh, we're all having tablets, uh, computers. Everything is, is becoming more digital and connected. So the world is changing in basically a, a, connect, a collection of, of digital propositions. Um, we also like to speak about ecosystems. And that's also the case for healthcare. And healthcare is a bit special because uh, we're dealing with health information, um, sensitive information. So things move a little bit differently there. And one particularly interesting issue here is that there's no one digital front door. So we have different touch points at different areas um, uh, where we can interact with the ecosystem and with the different aspects. So let's look at some, uh, some pictures. Um, we see that digital technology is enhancing our lives, is enhancing healthcare. So don't try to read everything, it's just an example. But we see, for example, that we have art of, um, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, to, um, for example, aid uh, doctors and clinicians in the clinic. Um, we have artificial intelligence that try to get some value out of medical data, but also help the clinicians to diagnose uh, based on, uh, for example, images. Um, we have robotics, surgery robotics, for example. Uh, we can now, with the Da Vinci robot, uh, have a surgeon in the United States perform an operation some, on somebody here in the Netherlands. So that's quite cool. Um, we have lots of computational technologies. Well, the list goes on and goes on. So there's a lot of digitalization going on, um, and um, everything is becoming more and more connected. Well, Philip's answer for this, uh, for this uh, um, digitalization is there health suite uh, platform. So what is this platform? Um, well, basically it connects the dots in healthcare. So it is the glue between all these different aspects in the ecosystem. As you can see, we have different technologies. We have the people, uh, both the patients as well as the clinicians, but also the supportive staff. We have all kinds of solutions for the customer. Um, Devices, we still have all kinds of medical devices, of course, the, the scanners, the patient monitors, uh, everything that is in a hospital or in a clinic. And uh, not to forget the data. Uh, we're becoming a more data-driven society. Uh, we're storing more data, we're trying to use data more. Um, and uh, this data is, is key and is, is central. So what they try with this health suite platform and this health suite system is, is basically connect everything. Um, they form the glue in, in the whole ecosystem for both their own applications as well as third-party applications. And they offer a customer services as a service platform. Well, that's a whole mouthful. Um, but it basically means that they are servicing their own customers themselves and, and third parties. Well, what we try to achieve here is what they call in healthcare the quadruple aim. So we want to have better health outcomes. We want to improve the patient experience. Uh, we want to improve the experience of the clinicians, the doctors. Uh, and we want to reduce costs, because costs are rising, everything is becoming more and more expensive, and we want to keep it all affordable. We, we all don't want to pay more uh, uh, health insurance costs, of course. So um, uh, we try to reduce this. Well, what's very important, I already addressed it uh, uh, in the beginning, is, is privacy. So we're dealing with medical systems, medical data, and that's very privacy sensitive. That's because on the one hand, you have your personal information, uh, things that are maybe wrong with you, your, your diseases or, or treatments that you had, uh, you don't want to share that with everybody, right? On the other hand, we also have uh, patient safety. Uh, patient safety is also really important because if you're in a scanner, you don't want it to break down, you don't want to have a too high dose of radiation, um, you want your medicine to be correct, uh, it's, it's not nice if your medical dossier is being corrupted or altered and you get the wrong medicine. So privacy, safety, those are all really important aspects. So we need to protect this medical data very well. So the question then arises, where should we run our software? Where should we store our data? How should we handle that? And there are different flavors, but the trend that we currently see is that, in, in general, things are moving to the cloud. 
everything is becoming more, more, more and more connected. Uh, the clouds have lots, lots of benefits, but there are also downsides. We also see this trend in healthcare. We see that more and more uh, of our software and our systems and our services are moving towards the cloud. And I want to show you a little bit of a comparison. It's by no means an exhaustive list, but just some pros and cons to further introduce the problem. So the advantage of going to the cloud is, for example, scalability. It's really easy to get more storage, to get more compute, and only pay for what you use. With one click of a button, you can actually scale up or scale down if you need less. And there's also high availability. It's really easy to um, have redundancy and to make sure that your systems are always up and always available. Well, Facebook did not did a good job recently, as you all noticed, but you can do it the right way, and uh, you have high available services. But there are also downsides, because if everything goes through the cloud, compared to when it is in the hospital, on-premises, um, you might have higher latencies. And that might not be a problem for an AI algorithm running, uh, uh, processing some images or, or uh, deriving some, uh, some classifications. But imagine you have a patient monitor, a heart monitor, and the patient is there uh, on the ICU. Um, and this signal goes to the cloud, some analysis, and it goes back. And there is uh, maybe a blackout, or, or just in general, it is a long connection. Um, and then the, then the doctor sees, well, this patient uh, had a cardiac arrest three minutes ago. Well, he's probably dead now. So you don't, you don't want it. You need short response times, short, uh, low latencies. So high latency can be uh, a con. And from a privacy perspective, the question is, where is my data? If it's in the cloud, it's somewhere in some data center. Uh, it might be in the United States, might be in China, might be in Africa, might be in Europe. But you don't know exactly where it is. That's really an issue, especially nowadays, where privacy is becoming more and more important and people care about where their data is, where it's stored, who is who's able to access it, and who is able to process it. So let's look at the other side, on-premises. Well, the obvious pro here is that you have low latency, because it's all close. Hey, your, your computers are in the basement of the hospital, you have your, your uh, fast network on-premises, so you have fast response times. And another benefit is that your data is stored locally. You know exactly where it is because it's on the hard drives on your computer that is standing next to you or that is in the basement. So that's nice from a privacy perspective. So what are then the downsides? Well, you have to maintain your own infrastructure. And cloud companies are experts in maintaining infrastructure. That's their core business. But as a hospital, your core business is um, giving care, not maintaining all kinds of IT infrastructure. So you need to have experts for that. And they, those are costly. Um, you also pay for what you typically don't use, because you, you buy a couple of computers, and you typically buy them uh, with a bit of a, a future, future vision, right? Uh, such that you don't have to buy a new one every month. So you, you buy a lot of stuff that you not necessarily use, and that's less efficient, so less cost efficient. So let me ask the question again. Where do we process our data, where do we run our software, where do we store everything? Well, it depends. It depends on the use case, right? Sometimes it's easier to do it on-premises, sometimes it's better to do it in the cloud, sometimes you want to have a combination. So questions you should ask yourself is, are there any uh, privacy or regulatory constraints that we need to uh, take care of? Are there performance constraints? like the, the monitoring example that I just uh, told you about. And is our software ready? Because you cannot say, well, we have a software uh, a system here, and now we can just move it into the cloud. That's not the case. You need to transform it. Maybe uh, you need a different architecture. So there needs to be work done. So to conclude, we need hybrid solutions. We need a way to, uh, on the one hand, support cloud applications, and on the other hand, support um, applications and software on-premises. Well, that's exactly where my project was about. So the problem description is design and develop a solution, or rather an extension for Health Suite in this case, that enables secure communication between applications in the cloud and applications on-premises in hospitals or other clinics. All right? So that was my job. 
So given this really big and complex health suite system, um, they said, well, fix us an extension that uh, enables this hybrid, uh, this, uh, this, this hybrid capability that we can actually uh, connect these applications. Well, the good news is it worked. We were able to, to find something. And the challenge here is that Philips is a global company, so they operate all over the world. And all, all countries have different rules and different policies and, and different infrastructures, so that's quite challenging to find something that works everywhere because they don't want customized solutions uh, all over the place. They want a generic, generic solution. So let's look how that then works. And again, a little disclaimer, I'm not allowed to share all the details, but I want to give the general, the general picture. Um, so here at the right, we see the Philips Health Suite Cloud. It's a secure system where we can host applications and services with which we as consumers can connect into and, uh, and run all kinds of medical applications. Here on the left, we see the hospital. And uh, both the cloud as well as the hospital, they, they run different applications. And um, here in the hospital, for example, we have these big MRI scanners, and they produce really big images. So, so uh, an image can be, for example, uh, five or six gigabytes. And that's typically something you want to keep on premises. But for example, your uh, medical records, they typically go to the cloud because then you're also able to access it from your home with your smartphone. And that's nice, right? We all want to be able to see what's happening with us, with us uh, directly have access to your medical records. You don't want to go to the hospital, ask for a, a CD, for, give me my medical data. That's, that's not convenient anymore. So we need to bridge this gap here. And uh, we were actually able to do so. So we designed a secure connection that in a generic fashion can connect any clinic, any hospital, with the Philips Health Suite Cloud. Moreover, we were able to uh, design a system that has uh, really fine granular access control. So we can specifically determine what goes out and what comes in, but also the other way around, what goes out of the hospital and what goes into the cloud. And that's specifically important if you look at data locality and data sovereignty, in privacy in general, we want to know where our data is, where it goes, and who has access to it. And with this system, we are able to do so. So this is uh, of great benefit to uh, the customers, the patients, the clinicians. So from an application perspective, if you have a top-down view, we have a different set of applications. They run on different platforms, so uh, different clouds, uh, the Philips cloud, uh, different premises. And what we now added is actually this part, so we are now able to include applications that are hosted and run on a private premises behind firewalls and all kinds of security measures. Because hospitals are little fortresses, they're really well protected, so that's the good thing. Um, we really care about medical data, um, so that's, that's really well protected. And uh, we are basically to integrate all these applications into end-to-end -end customer solutions. And that's nice. So what have we achieved? Well, first of all, we made a design and an accompanying proof of concept implementation. We have an extension for Health Suite that enables these secure hybrid solutions for customers. Well, second of all, we have a highly secured and controlled platform, and that is one of the key elements. We need to be privacy friendly, it needs to be secure. We don't want data leaks with our medical data. We have, therefore, enhanced privacy for care facilitators, so it's getting better. It was already good, but it's even getting better. We have a platform that is really lightweight to integrate with, so that's also nice for developers and uh, uh, people at Philips or third-party customers, also competitors like Siemens. We, we try to be compatible um, to get the best care for everyone. So it's really easy to integrate with our platform. For us, it's also uh, easy to operate. So we can all remotely operate everything. We don't have to send the guy in anymore with a USB stick for updates. So it's a really nice, open, unified, standardized platform that enables uh, better privacy-friendly customer solutions. And then we are already at the end. Time flies. So I hope that I 
was able to give you an idea about my project, what the problem was, what we uh, designed, how we solved the problem, and uh, what the benefits are for uh, both Philips, the customers, the clinicians, and of course the patients. Thank you for your attention, and uh, feel free to ask questions. Thank you, Tom. I see Chris? there is one question. Well, first of all, you need to answer the question, what is secure? What does it mean, yeah, right? That? Well, that depends. <laughs> that depends on the situation. So one of the first things I did was actually uh, make a security model um, and, and define what we mean with secure. Um, but um, yeah, you can see the cloud in this case as a secure fortress. So we have this, this cloud platform that uh, hosts all kinds of applications. Um, and this platform is built on... on um, yeah, I'm not going to get into all the details, but it's built on a secure platform, uh, application hosting platform. There, there, there's network segmentation going on. We have divided the whole thing in, in different zones. Um, and uh, we, we, are, we are really sure that uh, the data maintains uh, at the place where it's supposed to be. Um, furthermore, uh, of course, we have, have lots of security audits. Uh, uh, healthcare is one of the most strictly regulated areas in the world, so there's lots of compliance and certifications going on, and, and Philips is one of the few companies that actually has all the certifications, and that's also why they offer their platform to others, um, because it's really difficult to, to get that far. And if you're going to communicate between clouds, yeah, you need, of course, uh, you need to use secure uh, communication protocols, uh, the proper cryptographic protocols, um, and we are using state-of-the-art technologies. And uh, I'm happy to see that we have good security experts at Philips and uh, that they're taking it really seriously. Thank you. I'm glad the hackers can't intercept my data. <laughs> For you, we make an exception. Okay. <laughs> Jorge. Maybe I can see it a bit here. Yeah, uh, well, uh, thank you, Tom, for uh, uh, this contribution to making uh, healthcare a better uh, service for all of us. Uh, I have a one question. I know you are a security enthusiast uh, and probably an expert on the topic, and uh, Philips, well, they take uh, this really into consideration. Uh, let's suppose that uh, I want to... Uh, sell this idea, privacy, data security is important for uh, one of my clients. Uh, how do I convince them that this is really important? How do I tell them uh, that this will benefit them and not just uh, their clients? How could I do that? And then you mean uh, you, you pretend you're Philips and you have to sell this system to your customers, to your clients. That's what you mean, right? Yeah. So those are hospitals and other clinics and... Uh, and Indeed. Right? Yeah. Well, first of all, luckily we don't have to convince them much because they're already aware. So they are really uh, careful with their data and they are really reluctant to go to the cloud and to, to open up everything. So that's also something we noticed. And what I noticed during this design that it's really difficult to get some device into the hospital, into their networks. They don't like black box devices. They want to know what's going on. So um, um, they are already aware. And uh, everything that you can offer to improve security and privacy is, is very welcome. Of course, uh, you need to convince them that your product is actually correct and, and, and secure because they sell you all kinds of shit nowadays. Pardon my French. But... Um, <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff nowadays that they sell as really secure, really, really, uh, really, really good, really privacy friendly. But you need to show that somehow. And that's, that's mainly also based on trust, right? So trust and transparency, those are really, really important things. So you need to build a trust relationship. You need to show that you have taken care of all your, all your assets, um, that you comply with all the regula regulations, that you comply with all the certifications. Uh, they also require that often. So uh, that, that's something we can show. We have, the, we have the regulations, we have the certifications, we comply. Um, sometimes you can just explain and show them how it works and, and build up trust if they can see that it actually uh, fulfills the promises. And that's also what we, what we do. Of course, we do not disclose everything, but 
enough to, uh, to give them a proper idea of how it works. And we always um, um, open up the discussion, right? We, do, we don't say, well, we have this super fantastic product here, you must buy it. But we all, always go to dialogue with these people and say, what do you want? Can we, can we um, meet your wishes? What's important? What's not important? And how can we tailor uh, everything towards your, your, your desires? I see. Thank you. Satisfied? Yeah. You're going to buy transparency. <laughs> I will, for sure. See, Ankit has a question. I think it's easier. Uh, just, uh... Uh, yeah, very nice presentation, first of all. Uh, I, uh, my question is related to interoperability. Uh, so, w w did the project involve any interoperability challenges? Because I remember you mentioning uh, the platform is open for third party. Uh, applications, so yeah. uh, if at all, how were the interoperability challenges addressed? Uh, well, that's a, a very important part of this, this uh, product um, and project. Um, so the, the core of this system is basically an interoperability layer. Philips spends a lot of attention to interoperability, uh, is in lots of standards bodies, um, in order to make everything compatible, because the only way to, to win this battle and to improve is, is if things can work together. So integration is, is key. Uh, you can only integrate if you standardize. So uh, uh, the extension is also based on, on a um, uh, well, standards layer where you basically uh, define the way how things can communicate and via what standards. Um, so yes, interoperability is really important for both your own applications as well as third party applications. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, able to disclose everything, but this is really an important thing within Philips, and they have lots of interoperability teams and, and, and systems that um, make sure that things work, and especially in healthcare, because devices and, and software needs to work for a very long period of time. Uh, an MRI scanner needs to work for 20 years or longer, and then your software is already ancient, so somehow you need to keep these things in the air and, and working. So, uh, yeah, operability is key here. Yeah. Okay, that's the answer question. Yeah. Uh, Nikki? Uh, my question is, uh, which security aspect did you support by your solution? Uh, is integrity, availability, and confidentiality all supported by your uh, proposed solution? And how did you test it? Yeah, that's a good question. So these are different security aspects, right, for the non-security people here in the room. Uh, so if you derive your security requirements or define your requirements, then you need to think of what do we need to protect and how and against what. So confidentiality is important. Uh, are, are things... Uh, can we disclose things or not? Integrity of the data is important. Um, availability is important. The system can be very secure, but if it's offline uh, all the time, then it doesn't really work, right? So these are all aspects um, captured in non-functional requirements. And um, um, I made a, a threat model, and based on that model, we identified which assets should be protected against what. Um, that gave us the basis for our security requirements, and then you're going to find measures and technologies that basically fulfill, the, fulfill these. Um, confidentiality and integrity is, is almost always important. Um, Non-repudiability -repudi is also uh, uh, often important. Availability as well, but was uh, not really a, a, a focus of this project, because it was about design mainly, uh, showing that the proof of concept works. So there's lots of access control here. Um, but availability is also, is also partially about um, the ability to scale up and, uh, and to do load balancing. Um, those requirements are defined, but uh, was, those were not the focus of my project. And how did we test? Well, I built a proof of concept, so a prototype that actually implemented these new components. Uh, so this communication relay that I designed, uh, with which we could actually show that, that the concept and the access control mechanisms and everything works. Uh, and it needs to be productized now, so uh, we're, uh, we're working on that. Thanks for clarifying it, and based on uh, your explanation, did uh, you uh, do risk assessment uh, as well? Because you said uh, you found assets and uh, yeah. it was, was yeah, it so part of your project. 
So security uh, is for a large part risk assessment. In general, project management is risk assessment, right? So you need to, you need to know what you're doing. You need to identify the risks and, and define contingency plans and mitigation strategies um, in general for any project. But specifically for security, you need to identify your cr crown jewels. You need to identify what is important to protect and what is not. Um, and then determine uh, against what to protect it and how. And it's always also a cost balance trade-off and also a usability uh, a security trade-off, because the, those are often uh, not compatible with each other. Thank Hello. you. Thank you. I don't know. Maybe somebody wants to ask a question. From, from, from home, from home, maybe. They wanna... Somebody managed to hack us. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens, yeah. I, I think I can tell you that um, Tom has presented just like tip of the iceberg of his results because it is a, a highly confidential project. He couldn't uh, really <laughs> share much uh, yeah. in this case, uh, but indeed the questions you have asked, he has done also either extra security analysis using some techniques, more state-of-the-art techniques, uh, uh, and identified certain issues. And I think Tom's solution indeed would enable the interoperability between different hospitals in a secure way. So and that was, that's why I think it was quite well um, Accepted. I remember one of the architects from Philips also told me, like, this is such a nice solution. Why didn't we think about it? And I think that's why they maybe decided to offer you a position as an architect, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was a secret or not. No, it's not a <laughs> not secret. Not secret, right? Secret. So I think joining as a cloud architect at Philips. Yeah. So I think. And uh, in your case, um, uh, I want to ask, what was the um, biggest lessons learned? Eh? So as you gained juniors and attendance, so... Yeah. Also watching online, uh, some of them. Yeah, the biggest lesson learned. So I think the most important thing that I learned in, the, in my project was that uh, interpersonal skills are at least as important as technical skills. Because on the one hand, of course, you need to be technically uh, knowledgeable enough to, to come up with a proper solution. But on the other hand, uh, you never work alone. And especially, uh, you need to convince others uh, from other departments, customers, or your own team members, that what you have designed, what you have built, is actually good. They, they need to want it. You can build the best system in the world. If nobody wants to use it, it sits nice on your, on your sh shelf, but you need to work with people. Uh, typically, in big companies, you need to uh, also get budget to get things done, get resources, get people on board. So, working together with people from all different disciplines, uh, different cultures, that's important, and uh, I realized that that's really an important factor uh, and that you should not underestimate that. So uh, that's also nice within this PDN program that there is a big emphasis on this professional skills, these interpersonal skills, and uh, you need them, especially if you, if you grow in your job and, and, and are going into more designer, architecture, and management roles. And that's also something I liked. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be my biggest lesson learned. Yeah. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. So our last but not least uh, speaker is Rusril Raji. He has done his graduation project at uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. It's one of the two projects at Thermo Fisher Scientific. The other project was also about the deployment of the cloud solutions, and uh, this is in a different direction. So the floor is yours. Hello? Does it work? Yeah, okay. Oh, and then. Okay. A little bit less. Okay, good. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm going to present you what I've done in the last 10 months. So, as you can see on the screen, that uh, this is the title of my project. So, I was conducting a feasibility study and design for a system called SWOT. So this is the agenda. Uh, in total, there are eight items, and then I will go through them one by one. And uh, I did my project in Thermo Fisher Scientific, and then for anyone who is wondering uh, wh who they are, so uh, they are the, manuf uh, the, the world leader in manufacturing the um, scientific instruments. And then to show you how big this organization organization currently, 
around 50% of COVID-19 um, is tested uh, by, uh, by their uh, instruments. One of their products is called uh, TAM, or Transmission Electron Microscopy. It is one of the state uh, of the arts in uh, micro microscope uh, domains. And there are two types of micro microscopes that they have. First is Titan, and the second one is Talos. For Titan, it is intended for the high-end user, and for Talos, it is intended for uh, middle and low-end users. And the main focus of my project was on Titan. And there are uh, four types of uh, microscope for Titan, and then they are Krios, Metrios, Spectra, and also Temis. And the main focus of my project was on Krios and Metrios. So I'm going to tell you more uh, in detail related to my project. So there are three types of user in Thermo Fisher, and they are material science, life science, and semiconductor. And in order to control our microscope, our user needs to interact uh, via software. And then when we talk about software in such a big machine, there are multiple software layers inside. And then in order to make it simple, uh, I decided to remove some layers there. So the closest layer is called application software. And in this layer, there are three applications, and they are Velox for material science, EPU for life science, and Metrios for semiconductor. So um, basically our user interacts directly with these applications. And in order to be able to access the hardware components of our microscope, it has to go through a, a layer called platform software, or we also call it time server. Basically, the main job of this layer is to provide an API so that the, all the applications can, can access the hardware components. So as you can see here, this layer, if we can make a contribution into this layer, then it will indirectly serve all the applications here. That's why this is the, the main interest of this project, so platform software layer, and together with its logging environment. So every time our user access the microscope, it gives a lot of comments. And then these comments will be saved into the logging environment. Let's dive into this platform software layer. So inside this layer, there are multiple building blocks. And for each building block, it belongs to one or two uh, departments. So as you can see here that uh, uh, this project involves multiple team and multiple um, departments. And for each building block, it has its uh, a specific way of uh, saving log message. It has a specific domain, and also it has a different uh, low-level design. When a problem occurs, all TEM engineers that consist of a system integration team, architects, developers, they, are, uh, they come to this logging environment in order to troubleshoot the, uh, the issues. Currently, before the, uh, currently, they do it uh, manually. So they analyze all the contents uh, by themselves. And one of the approaches that they do is by tracking the component calling sequences. So, however, this uh, process is really time consuming and also very difficult. So the question now is that why? why it is uh, time consuming, and why it is difficult. I will explain to you the reasons uh, from three perspectives, and one perspective is from a uh, log logging perspective. So, we have our log files. But when we see the content, 
Uh, there are actually some interaction between the building blocks. However, there is no explicit execution path there. So inside the log file, they don't really indicate um, which, uh, which method or which software component it's called or not, and also the interaction between them. So it makes the analysis process uh, difficult. And also, there are some inconsistency uh, inside, the log, uh, inside the log files. So that's why there are a lot of um, patterns inside there. As I already mentioned that it involves uh, different departments, so that's why they have uh, different concerns and the, uh, they have different type of contents. And also another, another reason is that there are, there are some component execution attributes in, inside the log files. So that's why in one log file it has complete data, in, but in the other file it has only some parts of uh, the, the data. So it makes uh, the, the analysis difficult also. Based on this, I extracted the first problem statement. It is how to analyze the execution path based on the log files from temp server. And from this, I got my first goal which is to assess the possibilities of tracing the calls between functions inside and between building blocks. It is worth mentioning that uh, this project was a feasibility study and also Greenfield. That's why uh, in the beginning of this project, no one really knew whether it is possible to build such a execution path uh, with the current data. So now from the user perspective, so temp engineers, they need to manually build the execution path. How? So the question now is that how? How can they build this execution path? There are two ways. First is by reading the log, uh, the log content manually. So basically they read all the contents inside the logging and then they build the execution path in, uh, in their mind basically. And based on their intuition and also based on their experience, uh, they can get the, the insight of uh, what, what is happening inside the machine. The, the second approach is by combining some log files uh, using their customized scripts. And by doing this, they can get the bigger overview of the system so that uh, they hope that they can get the, uh, the idea of what is happening inside. From this, I got my second problem statement, which is how to visualize the execution path of the temp server. So, um, because, well, before this project, uh, uh, we didn't really know what kind of, whether there is a visualization that can really show the execution path or not. And from this one, um, I got also the, uh, the second goal, which is, to propose the tooling that makes possible to visualize the call pass, including the multi-trading situations. Mm -hmm. So, from the third perspective, which is from the existing tool perspective, we have a, an existing uh, tool called uh, Renaissance, and this Renaissance basically shows you the, depend the static dependency of the system. Basically, it shows you all the possible path, all the possible execution path. Uh, so that's why um, it has a drawback because it only shows you all the possible paths uh, without really showing you what is happening inside the real-time execution. And from this, uh, it, it becomes difficult to really assess uh, whether a component is used or not, for example whether a component that should be executed but uh, shouldn't. That's why I got the, my third problem statement, which is how to assess the usage of the specific parts of the temp server. And then uh, from there, uh, I got my third goal, uh, which is uh, to map software components and their activity during the software execution. So based on these three goals, uh, we concluded that if I, we could achieve all of them, we would have a system called SWOT, or Software Execution Auto Tracing. And with this tool, uh, we hope that it can help troubleshoot the software issues and 
it can help assess the usage of the specific parts of the, the software uh, stack. Now the visibility analysis. So based on some requirements that I got, I defined all the topics that I needed to, uh, to analyze even more. And first, I'm going to tell you more about the execution path. Uh, to answer the first goal, uh, I found that uh, it is possible to build the execution path based on only the logging files, the logging data. First is by filtering based on a category called method invocation and their log files. Then order the data based on the, uh, the timestamp attribute. After that, group them based on the process and thread IDs. And after I've done all of them, then I can extract the package class add method names from the message, uh, from the message attribute. So it has answered uh, the first goal. Now for the building blocks. Initially, we scoped uh, the, the analysis to only two building blocks, which are optics and also acquisition. But then we decided to expand uh, the scope to other building blocks except vacuum and ancillary. The reason was because for ancillary, it was too complex. There were too many different components inside and we decided to scope it. And for a vacuum, because there was no component calls in their logging. So bad luck, basically. Okay, and then we found that it was necessary to create another module or to pro process uh, all the log files because you know there are too many inconsistencies and too many different patterns inside that. So that's why we came into conclusion to build another module called uh, pre-processing module. I will not go into detail here, but basically in total there are five. Uh, uh, pre-processing steps. First is that uh, we need to do log filtering, conversion, cleaning, extraction, and transformation. And of course, that uh, there were some aspects that we discussed uh, during the project. Uh, one of them was the language, and then based on all the, the important criteria, we decided to go with Python. And for data visualization, we try to get all the possible um, path execution visualization, and then we got four options. First is communication graph using a tool called CVs. Second one, graph network visualization using Elastic Stack. Third one is time series pattern using a, a tool called Trace. And last but not least, a common pattern using a technique called process mining. Now, based on these options, uh, we decided, uh, well, we also defined all the feature criteria, and then we concluded that we would go with trace, cabin network, and process mining. The reason why we excluded uh, CVs, because it has exactly the same benefits as trace. So for the result, so uh, before I show you the visualization result, I would like to also uh, tell you how to operate uh, this system. First, user needs to execute a tool called DAR. And uh, this is a diagnostic analytic tool uh, in, inside the microscope in order to get all the log, uh, log files. And then after that, the microscope will provide the DAR log files. Then, user needs to insert it into the pre-processing pre module that we have. It will provide the pre-processed log files, and then user needs to insert it to the visualization modules. And in the end, as we know that we have three visualization modules. So this is the first visualization using the uh, Elastic Stack. I will not go into detail here, but uh, basically, as you can see, uh, the benefit of this visualization that you can see the overview level of the system, what's happening inside. And of course, you can always go into detail and then see how many times uh, a method is called and also how many times an interaction ha is happening. And next is the time series visualization. And again, I will not go into detail here. 
But here, the, the benefit is that you can see the order of the execution. Because we have uh, time unit here in the x-axis. So yeah, um, different than the previous one where we don't really know the order or yeah, the sequence. Here we can see that. And of course, there are multiple tools there uh, that you can also use to enhance your analytics. And then, yeah, of course, you can zoom in and so on. And last but not least is the common pattern visualization. So for this visualization, uh, the main benefit is that you can see what is the most common patterns inside your log uh, files. For example, here, it is executed uh, 35 times, and then there are two components that are executed there. And uh, the log files has it for about like almost 2%. And for the, for last uh, last but not least, I would like to also show you the how we how I combine uh, the SWOT result with the existing tool. Uh, for currently for the tool that I already mentioned, which is Renaissance, uh, when you want to see all the dependency inside them, you can do that in the high level, but they cannot really show it in the low uh, low level. So that's why by combining SWOT and Renaissance. Uh, we can get the relation also in the low level uh, design. So to summary uh, my project, first is that we were able to, uh, to build the execution path uh, inside and between building blocks uh, by do doing some uh, steps there. And also we propose uh, multiple tools uh, to be able to visualize the call pass, including multi-trading situation with three visualizations there. And also we can map the software components and their activity during the software execution by combining SWOT and Renaissance. For feature recommendation, first is that to complete and also uniform the log data. Currently inside the logging environment, there are multiple um, multiple formats and also multiple patterns. By combining them, um, by not really combining, but uniforming them, uh, we hope that we can focus more on getting the insight instead of uh, spending time on uh, you know, uh, building the pre-processing uh, module, for example. And the second one is to save the data into database instead of to log files. Currently, the data is saved in log files. That's why it affects the performance. Due to that, uh, currently time engineers, they are a bit reluctant to, uh, to save more data. And in consequence, the SWOT uh, result, um, uh, there are some situations where it, it has a lack of data. And by saving it to database, we hope that it can have better performance so that, uh, so that uh, time engineers can uh, be more confident in saving more data. Now, uh, for the SWOT execution itself, uh, there are so, uh, some steps that are still done manually. Um, then here, I propose to also automate uh, the first three steps. And last but not least, is related to the automation of the assessment process. And currently for SWOT, uh, it can help uh, in assessing the, um, the uh, in detecting the sort of problem. However, by, in, uh, by extending it with, uh, with, the, with the automation of uh, the assessment, for example, that we can also use a machine learning uh, approach called anomaly detection, we hope that we can also automate uh, this process. And that's all. Do you have any questions? So, Jorge again. <laughs> yeah, if I may, of course. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yusril, for the presentation. It yeah. uh, has been a pleasure to work with you for these two years. And I have a very interesting question for you, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, how much of the time, what is the proportion uh, that uh, people at the uh, Thermo Fisher spend on cleaning the logs, on preparing the logs? for doing the analysis uh, compared to doing the actual analysis to get insights. Do you have any idea? Okay, so 
just just want to make sure about your question. So how much time Thermo Fisher uh, spend time in basically pre-processing the log files before they do the analysis? Yeah. They don't really do the pre-processing. Because for the log, uh, logging environment itself, it wasn't really intended for doing something that is automatically done. So currently, what they do, so when there is a problem in the customer side, they will send all the log files into the engineers and they check it manually. And then see where the problem is. In some cases, uh, this analysis process could take like uh, more than one or even two months uh, involving uh, multiple teams. That's why we, uh, they came with this idea to automate this process of analysis. I Does see. it answer your question? Yeah, I mean, one, two months, I think that's quite some time that they could true, true. say by following uh, your uh, yeah, proposal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So you mentioned that you might, uh, if you organize it differently, be able to store more data about the execution process. Uh, if I were developing, say, a module, uh, would you have any advice on what data would be most useful to store? Mm -hmm. What data? So it really depends what you want to achieve. For example, if you want to see how the behavior is inside your machine, and of course that the software execution or the method execution is one of the options. But for example, if you want to know about the users, resource usage, then of course the memory consumption should be a good, uh, good indication there. So you can maybe get the, the, time, uh, the execution time of your uh, specific components. So uh, it really depends on what you want to achieve there. And for this anomaly detection that you were talking about, do you have yes. any idea, what, uh, given the type of anomalies you might want to detect, what uh, would be the data yeah, most useful there? Okay. Yeah, uh, for that one, um, memory consumption can be also an option because I mentioned about uh, the previous example that uh, it, it took like one or two months to analyze the source of, to get the source of problem. And in the end, it was all about the uh, memory leak. And then uh, finally it was solved. But if we can't get this memory, uh, memory consumption data inside the log files, then we might be able to analyze it uh, faster because at least for the, uh, in Thermo Fisher, we don't really lock that into the logging environment currently. So that's why uh, it was quite a, uh, a challenge uh, for, uh, for us to really uh, get this source of problem. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my question is also, uh, yeah. because I worked before in Philips and NXP, and there uh, the similar problems were encountered. There are already the proprietary solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So before you dive into it, what kind of state of the art techniques have you uh, identified that could be applied directly? Um, the trend currently is anomaly detection, of course. Uh, but however, there are a lot of works that uh, we need to do uh, before we can really achieve uh, that goal to do anomaly detection. For example, the data. We have to make sure that the data really supports uh, uh, that uh, approach. Because if, for example, your data is not that uh, a good or it uh, doesn't really give proper proper uh, properties, then it will be hard. And another visualization uh, approach that I think is state of the art is CVIS, the one that I already showed uh, previously. And then it was published around 2018 or 19, uh, but in the end I decided to, um, to remove it from uh, the scope because it was still new and then there are, uh, it's not that mature. And then maybe in the next five years, three or five years, hopefully it becomes more mature uh, so that uh, we can uh, leverage uh, that uh, technology also. Yeah. Great. Thank you. If there are no further questions, then mm -hmm. we can thank the speaker again. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, I have five minutes to close up the session. 
Um, I want to thank again all the participants who have uh, come to join our symposium this year. And this um, is the first time actually our trainees had to work full time online during COVID. And all the 18 trainees managed to finish their project on time without delay. And all of them actually um, have joined the industry. So I'm, we are very proud uh, with the achievement of this uh, generation. It has not been easy for them doing part of the training uh, on, I mean, with us online and then doing everything online. Uh, so that was quite an impressive one. I have one slide, let's see. Um, yeah, so I think this is the whole list. It's also not meant to be read. Uh, so today you had uh, just a few selection of final presentations of our graduates. Um, and uh, this is actually whole 18 list. And as you can see, we have companies from mostly Brainport area, ASML, Philips, uh, Signify. And also this year we had a collaboration with uh, two uh, Dutch government invested uh, projects and also we have had a nice project with Siemens from uh, Leuven. So, um, of course, uh, some of these trainees who managed to present today the results and sometimes we cannot present the results because it's highly confidential. Also want to thank the company, the industrial partners who enabled us to share some of the results at certain levels. So that was quite good. And uh, I also want to thank to many people. So. Today, when you look at these um, young talents presenting the results of a very complex uh, challenges, there are a lot of people behind. Uh, so I want to thank first our uh, scientific director, Mark van den Brand, and also assistant Desiree, my <laughs> partner in crime, <laughs> let's say. And uh, I also want to thank Harold Weffers. Harold is sitting over there. He was my boss when I was doing PDA in 2003 way, way, way long back, and also involved in our project acquisition because he's responsible for the external uh, coordination of the TUE, especially of our department. And also we have an advisory board from the industry. Uh, today we have a representative from that Rocher Western attendance. So uh, we work with, uh, let's say, the industrial leaders um, from Philips, ASML, Thermo Fisher and other companies helping us uh, make our program stronger and uh, mature. Um, so today some of the results, of course, coming from ASML, also just the representation. And also uh, the graduate school, SAI. So uh, we have uh, uh, the 35th year of anniversary in November, I think the 17th of November, I believe. And um, you will receive soon an invitation or you might have received this, check your inbox. And there we are going to celebrate the PDM programs, not only PDM software technology, but all the PDM program of the Netherlands. And uh, of course, my colleagues from PDA and ASD, MST, who are apparently not here, but uh, they are having their own graduation ceremonies and um, the collaborators of this uh, generation. So for the training projects, we had a collaboration with Bosch Security, CERN, Pixel Farming Robotics, uh, uh, TNO, Valeo, Volvo, and European Space Agency. And uh, Volvo was and indeed the first time, usually when we do the project for the first time, I ask my trainees not to make <laughs> mistakes. But as usual, they haven't done any mistakes in any of it. So the point is they were uh, impressive. They have done, um, picked up the difficult project and shaped it and also made sure to be delivered uh, satisfying the customer needs. And of course, that's thanks to my trainees, but also the coaches like Han Schramene, who is in attendance. And also the final projects are supervised by the TUA people. So this afternoon, uh, during the graduation, uh, the ceremony, you're going to see the company supervisors because the last 10 months, even it's a complex project, a paid project, um, uh, the trainees are still under uh, growth. And uh, what we have uh, noticed and also acknowledged is that the growth of our individual trainees, even if it was online, our company supervisors have done an amazing job. And uh, some of you are here, uh, Nontas, uh, Ivo, I don't see also anybody. I think also uh, um, Fritz. <laughs> Fritz is here. Oh, oh. So, so there are many more people and they will be joining also in the afternoon. Also Raha's uh, supervisor is there. So uh, I think uh, we, have, we want to thank you because you have done an amazing job by taking our young talents uh, under your wings and making sure they also grow and mature without um, 
intervening their um, independent minds. And also want to thank again the um, companies who give us uh, interesting um, projects. And as you all know, Brainport region, we usually contribute to the 15% of the Dutch, gov Dutch uh, GDP, Dutch economy. And we like to talk about economic growth, etc. And the innovation is driving the growth, but in fact, they are the brilliant and innovative minds. And actually, in this audience, uh, probably the weight is quite high, so a lot of the brilliant minds are here. So we want to thank them again for giving us um, interesting challenges that we can um, work with and also contribute to the innovation of the Brainport region. So thank you again, and we're going to have now a pause of, let's say, coffee pause for half an hour. And be back at uh, uh, three o'clock here with the graduation uh, ceremony. Thank you again. See you in a minute.
Welcome, everybody. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you graduates of the Professional Doctorate in Engineering from the program Software Technology. I also would like to welcome family, friends, colleagues, and supervisors to this PDN Diploma Award Ceremony of the Eindhoven University of Technology, or abbreviated TUE. Today, we are proud to award 18 trainees from this Technological Designers Program their PDN Diploma, a professional doctorate in engineering. Currently, there are nine Technological Designers or PDN programs at the TUE, four at Delft University of Technology, and five at Twente University. The PDN programs have been around for 35 years, and today, TU Delft, University Twente, and the TUE have already trained more than 4,500 technological designers. The PDN programs have been created in close collaboration with industry. They correspond to the current needs of the high-tech sector. We train the best young engineers, the selection of the trainees is tough. An important task for the engineers is innovation or knowledge valorization. How to best transfer knowledge into value. While pure researchers are driven by curiosity and want to understand or predict phenomena, the real engineer wants to create value by, mean, by means of the creation of new and innovative artifacts. That is exactly what the technological designers programs are about and what our today's new PDN graduates have accomplished during their two-year program in industry. As of today, they may use the degree Professional Doctorate in Engineering or PDN. The PDN degree gives these designers an important advantage in industry. The extra knowledge and experience these PDN candidates have acquired usually can be gained after a number of years working in a company. We wish our new graduates a lot of success in their future career. I also want to I also want to provide a special thank you to partners in high-tech industry. The second year design projects conducted by our PDN trainees are proposed by the high-tech industry and, and it's the industry urgent need for innovation and design engineers who are not afraid to go beyond boundaries of disciplines that provide our PDN trainees the opportunity to learn and earn during these challenging second year design projects. These design projects are great examples of the cooperation between university research groups and the high-tech industry. We therefore also want to express our sincere gratitude to the TUE supervisors that offered support and guidance to the trainees during their projects. Before the ceremony begins, a fir first a brief explanation on the protocol. First, the supervisor of the university or industry will provide a short introduction on the graduate, an abstract on their thesis, and then will hand over the diploma. Additionally, the graduates receive the alumni gift offered by the TUE, because as of today, these graduates are officially alumni of the Eindhoven University of Technology. And a special word added to that before you come here, I will give over the diploma. TUE wants to give a, her graduates an alumni gift that says, proud to be from the TUE. This gift, a clean cut design tube for your PDN diploma, is inspired by the eye-catching red slash of the TUE logo. 
We will now start with our first candidate, Mr. Aziz, who will be addressed by Mr. Rongo Tigianis. Dear George, almost four years ago, I was standing exactly where you stand right now. At that point, I was wondering, how does it feel to stand at the other side? Well, today, I'm going to find out. It has been almost one year since you had your interview with us, hoping that you had found the right assignment, and we, the proper trainee, to work on that. Looking back at that point, I could not be happier with the decision we made. I have to admit that your project, Armoring Formal Components Against Foreign Behavior, was not an easy one. <laughs> your scope was gigantic, and the topics you had to research were far from simple. Nevertheless, you were fully committed from day zero. You took no shortcuts, and you always strived for excellence. Instead of going for the minimum viable product, you wanted to first learn and understand your fast learning skills allowed you to grasp, in a very short time, the, the delicate concepts of formal software engineering. Even more surprisingly, just in the second week of your assignment, you were already finding anti-patterns and asking our input on them. Now, George's professionalism and eagerness to learn quickly made him part of our team. And as we started to become colleagues, we also started noticing some interesting patterns about George. Firstly, George gives his own proof of the relativity theory. He would ask us for a quick meeting, and 45 minutes later, the discussion would still be going strong. Secondly, when it comes to challenges, George has three stages. At first, you see a happy and cheerful George, ready to take up the challenge. As we would further discuss it, George got a more serious face. And some days after, we would see an almost annoyed George, but in a good way. It turns out that in the meantime, he had found several dystopian corner cases, which would then spark so many interesting discussions. Thirdly, it's difficult to get George to discope things without working on them first. But I can't just withdraw from the fight without fighting first. Can I? That's what he was always asking us. Now, as the time progressed, George started to become the company's armoring expert by building solid uh, knowledge on delicate concepts and rather sophisticated tools. You were mastering language meta models as well as model-to-model -model transformations. Interestingly, there was another implicit transformation that you have mastered, and that's your commendable determination to improve yourself. I am certain that the emphasis you put on self-improvement is going to prove priceless for the future. Moreover, uh, as a supervisor, it was really a privilege for me to watch and see you grow during these 10 months. Um, and uh, as Einstein said, once we accept our limits, we can go beyond them. George, you did a fantastic work on your assignment, and I'm genuinely happy that you will be joining our team at ASML. There are plenty of challenges to tackle, more dystopian worlds to be discovered, and certainly unlimited opportunities to grow. For these future plans, you can definitely be very optimistic. Congratulations and all the best. I would like to call forward Mr. Beigne and Mr. Rauler. Yeah. Well, dear Samson, 
And as well, as I just explained to you over the coffee, the PDN program has a very strong reputation and everybody is looking to get the students. And so there's a lot of competition between the groups in ASML to secure a student for their projects. We had to actually fight to get you in our project and the fact that you positively selected our project was a deciding factor for us to get you in. So we are very thankful for that. And despite the image that ASML has for being a company that ha produces cutting edge technology, the tools that we use to create that technology is not always that cutting edge. In our group, where we create software for the image sensors, most of our code is written in C, which is a programming language uh, that originates in the 1970s. There is an intent to change to C++, but due to the always ongoing time pressure and cold feet under the more experienced colleagues, not much progress has been made. And this is where you came in. Have we invited you to convert one of our components as a test case from C to C++, and we hoped that would demonstrate the feasibility of this and, it, and, and that it would bring valuable benefits to, uh, well, to our code and uh, how we use it. And, and it, while doing that, we hope we would also learn have what challenges we might encounter while doing that and, and how to uh, address them. I was impressed by, with the speed at which you started. And the, the, the domain in ASML is, is usually quite complex and the documentation is not always complete, but despite that, you made quick progress in analyzing and redesigning the component. You made a solid plan for your work and you showed strong commitment to stick to that. You were so committed even that halfway your product, you confessed to us that you worked long nights to, to be able to keep up with your plan. Of course, we appreciated your drive to keep your promises, but I'm afraid we have been a little stern with you, uh, when, you when we learned of this, uh, this choice. Nevertheless, uh, we were very happy with the work you did. You proved to be very autonomous, and you had also no hesitation to approach people in the organization, had, which are complete strangers to you, that could help you when necessary. In the course of your project, you managed to convert almost the entire component to C++ whilst redesigning it to take advantage of object-oriented paradigms. You demonstrated that it can be tested, that the externally observed behavior of the converted component is unchanged, so that such a conversion can be done with limited risk. Your report contained useful tips for us how we can convert other components. There is still a small concern about performance that we need to look into further. In your application interview for the, for the PDN product, you indicated that you wanted to experience how it was to work in a, real, in a software development team in a real company. I'm afraid that due to the COVID measures, you didn't get the full experience. But um, yeah, in the meanwhile, you made a job application as ASML, and I'm happy to hear that you got hired and you actually start in my team after your graduation. So I hope that soon you will really experience how it is to work uh, in a software team in ASML. Um, I want to thank you for the work that you did for our group, and I look forward to, uh, to continue our cooperation. Congratulations with your well-deserved diploma. <laughs> How are they? <laughs> yeah, what's more important? <laughs> I would like to call forward Mr. Codera Kutz and Mr. Bosman. It's all about connecting. Good afternoon, my name is Rick Bosman, representing Rabobank. In the last 10 months, Jorge Cordero worked for Nordstar, the innovation department of Rabobank, wholesale and rural. Within this innovation department, we especially focus on connecting, bridging gaps between organizations and people. As Rabobank emerged from a small agricultural cooperative bank and the cooperative connecting foundation in the cooperative philosophy have remained our guiding principle throughout our history. And now Rabobank and TU Eindhoven are also connected through Jorge. Rabobank provided the assignment in Nordstar and various colleagues representing Rabobank helped you. The university was responsible for academic education of Jorge and provided supervision to guard the educational aspects for him. 
both the bank and university provided expert knowledge on the relevant ex um, uh, aspects of the problem domain. Jorge worked during his assignment on Credit Connect, one of the North Star solution spaces where we aim to connect smallholder farmers and credit providers. Because a loan provided by a credit provider leads to prosperity for the farmer, food for the society, and often focuses on sustainable practices. However, assessing a farmer's credit worthiness without financial history, no collateral and high risk factor is very difficult. And that's why we are developing a credit scoring model with alternative data. And Jorge did an, investiga an interesting investigation. The verification of such a model throughout a so-called monitoring engine. Um, and the outcome of his research um, um, is, is the model we create in line with the expectation? Or in other words, is the data we use connected with the model? The analysis and thought process of Jorge was not an easy journey, especially because of COVID-19 most of the work had to be done remotely. However, Rabobank is very happy with the results you achieved. And we hope that the monitoring engine we developed would prove its value, not only in Credit Connect, but in future uh, projects of Rabobank. And now the awarding of the diploma, Jorge. Congratulations. I would like to call forward Mr. Debna and Mr. Knelissen. Well, what's there to say uh, about, uh, about Nathan uh, and, and this project? He graduated uh, cum laude, so that says, that says a lot. Um, I remember that you started in the beginning of January, 4th of January, on a Monday, I think. I remember that day uh, very, very well. Uh, we were in uh, full lockdown. We were all working from, uh, from home. But uh, I had to pick you up at the reception at ASML to go to the IT department, take the laptop and your key fob, such that you could work via VPN from home. And during that day, uh, we talked about the project, we had coffee, and uh, the day passed uh, very quickly. And uh, after that, you were more or less on your own. And I did have some doubts, because you came across as a bit of shy person, so I was afraid that I had to take you by the, by the hand and do the stuff. But uh, that feeling quickly changed. Um, to give a bit of context about the project that uh, Nathan uh, did, uh, at ASML we develop uh, multiple products that have to work together in a customer production facility. These uh, products exchange data, and uh, uh, we want to test at ASML that when there is a change to one of these products, uh, the data exchange still works. Um, we created a, a test facility to do that. We call that the virtual fab that consists of digital twins, and we do some tests there. The tests generate uh, test reports and stuff like that, and we need to report on these test executions. Currently, we do that manually via Excel. Well, that's, of course, not sustainable, and Nathan's task was uh, to develop an application to automatically process the results and process a report. Um, we didn't have a clear dry requirements list for this application. Um, so we drafted a domain model uh, for Nathan. We explained some use cases that we were sure of. And after that, he had to discover the rest for himself. So find out the collected domain uh, knowledge uh, in an agile way, uh, find out what the requirements are, the use cases are, and immediately and let's say after a few, a few days, 
Nathan uh, created a, a, a data model, implemented that in a database, created user interfaces, web-based user interfaces, and that started off our agile journey to discover these use cases and requirements. Um, I've seldom seen an engineer that, takes, that learns new technologies as quickly as Nathan does and also delivers something useful. That was, yeah, I've never seen that, not many times seen that in my, in my long, long career. You're a great guy to work with. You're, you're energetic. You're willing to learn new things. You pick up new things. And that was also, for me, an energizing journey. So I would like to thank you eh, for what you delivered uh, to our team. And I'm also very glad that you uh, joined our virtual fab group at uh, ASML. Thank you, Nita. And next, I would like to call forward Mr. Gao and Mr. Algra. Dehan, congratulations on this day. Um, you hoped that this day would come, and it was a, uh, um, it was a long journey to uh, get here but I'm glad to uh, be allowed to speak to you and uh, tell a little bit about your project. So Hanek uh, did his project uh, at Thermo Fischer Scientific. We make electron microscopes, and uh, there is a lot of software today within the electron microscope, as well as in the ecosystem around the mi uh, microscope on how customers are integrating uh, the results of the microscope into their uh, environment. And creating software is one thing, and that's what there's a lot of emphasis on uh, in these uh, uh, programs. But then how do you get this program and actually deliver it at the customer site? Particularly if these customers are in very constrained environments where they're sensitive about the secrets they're working on in semiconductor or in research institutions. And that was the assignment that you were given. Basically, design a solution that, uh, that would allow us as a company in a standardized way to deliver all of these software solutions that the different groups are creating, deliver that to our, to our customers to the point in need of, uh, of install, potentially automatically uh, upgrading software where feasible. Um, I think your project was particularly interesting as it involved so many stakeholders within our company. We had all of the development groups that had some opinion on how software should be packaged and uh, uh, delivered. We have a service organization that is taking software and installing it today uh, using various mechanisms. Um, we have parallel initiatives on um, uh, digitizing our uh, infrastructure. And you had to work with uh, all of these teams, collecting requirements and uh, finding a common path forward that would actually uh, uh, satisfy the needs that uh, we have without exactly implementing precisely what everybody wanted. And uh, during one of the conversations, we uh, uh, realized that really what you were doing, uh, specifically in the beginning of your project, was more of a social engineering um, activity instead of uh, computer or software engineering. Now, um, I think those are very useful skills, and uh, you show to be pretty good in actually working with these different groups. As part of the regularization process, you had to interact as well with third-party uh, contractors we were working with in the Czech Republic, as well as with uh, different software vendors in the United States and in uh, Israel. And in the end, you designed a, a nice blueprint of, well, how we can streamline the process of bringing software uh, from our uh, software teams towards our uh, customers. And I would like to thank you with that and congratulate you with uh, the diploma. Next, I would like to call forward Mr. Van der Heide 
and Mr. Barry Foot. Dear Juan, so there we were, early January, sitting behind our screens, behind teams. What an awkward way of starting an OT graduation for all of us. Patrick, your other supervisor, who's also here, uh, and myself, trying to explain you our research work on generic workflow capabilities for the HealthSphere platform and Philips. A mouthful. We certainly threw you into the deep uh, at that time. I'm very convinced about that, and actually that's what we like to do in Philips Research, so we also did that to you. We explained a lot to you. We explained, we talked about the subtle differences between clinical protocols, clinical pathways, workflows, processes, and it must have been a lot. We talked about interoperability standards, BPM, HL7, FHIR. Uh, we talked about many clinical use cases that Philips is working on where clinical workflows and clinical protocols are, are very important. And then finally, around April, we were allowed to do something more face-to-face. -face. We could go to the office, we could stand before a whiteboard, we could have informal chats with the coffee, we even did some lunch walks to get to know each other a bit more personal. All these good things. And I think everybody, all of us, got a lot more energy. And we also clearly saw that with you. It helped a lot in, uh, in the whole project. So at that time, you also managed to grasp this whole complex thing that we're working on, and, and you really showed that you mastered the topic where we asked you to uh, contribute. So finally, what, what happened? I think you contributed a lot to our research work, a very significant contribution. Um, with your flexible and modular software solution and design that you've created, that will allow many of our solutions in Philips to define the workflows of their systems in a formal language, in a, model, a modeling language. It will also allow them to execute these definitions in a software environment uh, so that the application can do what it's supposed to do. Uh, very important, your design is so that we can use all kinds of software components that are commodity nowadays off the shelf uh, so that we don't have to make and maintain them ourselves. And last but not least, that will help many solutions in Philips to improve the protocol guidance or the compliance to medical protocols. And compliance to medical pro protocols has been proven over and over again to lead to better patient outcomes, and that's what we do it for. And I think you can be proud of your work because that work contributed directly to the mission we have in, in, in Philips, eh? uh, improving the life of 3 billion people a year by 2030, and you really contributed to that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, before I congratulate you, I want to say it was really a pleasure to work with you, and I think I also uh, talk on behalf of Patrick. Uh, we enjoyed the discussions we had, many discussions we had. Uh, we enjoyed the presentation that you gave to our internal audiences in Philips, uh, but also to external ones, very well done. And you're a very pleasant person to have in a team in general, so that's uh, well done, and thank you for that. So nothing more left to me than to congratulate and wish you all the best in your, uh, the further career, in your further career. And I'm happy to hear that the next step in that career will actually be at our department, so we'll meet again soon. Thanks a lot. Then I would like to give. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Kahn to come forward and Mr. Lutinak. Well, Trevor, it's been ten months. Some would say long months. Some would say short, uh, because uh, some of us uh, in uh, uh, from ASML side thought that you have two years to work on the project, uh, while well, in fact it was 10 months. Still, you managed to, uh, to do a lot, and uh, uh, I would like to say what your thesis was actually about. So it says automated sequence planner, but what, what does it actually mean? 
to illustrate, I'll give a, a, a point from, uh, uh, from our early discussions uh, when you were just discovering what, what we needed to do. Uh, so if you remember, then we discussed an uh, example of going to Disneyland. And we said, well, if I wanted to go to Disneyland from Eindhoven, uh, I could uh, book my flights, uh, I could uh, uh, then have to match it with the, with the trains and uh, have to find a hotel and all for the right dates and uh, for the right cost and so on. And then we said, what if we could just use computers for that? And we could just say, well, I want to go from Eindhoven to Paris, please find me a sequence of actions uh, that, that I need to perform. So schedule the flights for me, schedule the trains, schedule the hotels and all the other things. And uh, that's, when you get acquaint that's when you got acquainted with the automated planning. So uh, now you may wonder, uh, for, for the rest of the audience, what does Disneyland have to do with ASML? It wasn't, wasn't really working Disneyland. Well, at ASML we also do a lot of sequencing, or planning, if you will. And uh, 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 what uh, Jobar's thesis was about is uh, how can we automate that? How can we use uh, computers to do the boring and tedious tasks and uh, uh, leave humans to do uh, more interesting things? Uh, so I think uh, in, in all your, your study has uh, shown that it's feasible. And uh, uh, even, uh, even though <laughs> those 10 months uh, went by fast, uh, I think it was uh, a huge success. I think uh, we all learned a lot. Uh, I want to thank you for your hard work uh, during, uh, during this period. And I'm glad that uh, you will remain at ASML. And uh, uh, I want to congratulate you. Yeah. Then I would like to call forward Mr. Madian and Mr. Pellman. The other side. Um, automated lighting, so uh, that is what we are working on at uh, Philips Research, or Signify Research nowadays, is that uh, lighting that uh, continuously adapts to your liking, that gives you the light that you, that you like to have, and that quickly could also become annoying, and that is something that we definitely want to prevent. That is, uh, that is a dream that we have, to give you all the time the lighting that you you, uh, that, that gives you a pleasant feeling. And in order to accomplish that, because we are still a long way for, away from that, we think about sensors, we think about AI, and in order to develop the system that we would like to have, we need physical testing, like does it work? What sensors do we actually need? We don't know. And of course, if we have an AI model, which AI model is the best? That is where you came in. Uh, we started at the beginning of this year. I would say the start was rather challenging. We had the COVID situation, but also at our company, we just had a restructuring taking place, which made that, uh, I think at that moment, so the, uh, we as a stakeholder, were, we were maybe not super demanding at that point in time. Uh, um, in the beginning, you took the time to scout the various technologies that were of interest. Um, Mention like uh, ML Flow, uh, DVC, um, Anaconda. Um, and I think part of, let's say, I think a success that I see is that it's not about only about uh, identifying the right technology. It's also about convincing uh, the company or your customer to use those technologies. I knew about virtual environments. I knew about Anaconda. I knew about them four or five years ago. But I never saw the value of those. Today, uh, it is there on for every project that we do. I think um, 
you, you provided us, let's say, with regular updates. I think that you did that very well. You also, I think, were quite strong in organizing those. And I think the updates that you gave us, uh, I think, more formally every four weeks, a little bit less formal every two weeks, I think they are the best prepared updates that I have seen in my career. In the beginning of the project, it was about, uh, you wanted to get clear what are the requirements? What do you need to deliver? And I made sure that uh, I pointed out that I was not able to point out what I like to have. Because I just don't know. So that's, I think, we quickly, at some point, I think it took maybe two months or so, we said, okay, why don't we try to work more in a collaborative way? We, we, we become one team, we work in an agile approach, and yes, we do not really know where we're going to end up, but let's, let's try to get somewhere together. And I remember that we had some discussions like, is pre-processing of data, is that now part of a model? Because you can use the same pre-processing module for several models, or is it not? I think uh, I'm not yet completely clear about that, but I appreciated the discussions. Also about when we enforce an interface, do we do that via an abstract class, or do we generate a certain object of which we know that it always fits? I, th I appreciated the discussion, and I also appreciated the pair programming that we did. Uh, both being from slightly different backgrounds, I think that gives the most interesting discussions. Um, next to, let's say, developing and development on which we can test the algorithms, it's also about testing our ideas in practice. Today, we have uh, a system running in uh, AWS. We have several SageMaker notebooks to which you contributed, Raspberry Pis, and we have a mobile app in which our test participants can give feedback. So uh, adaptive lighting that, let's say, adopts to your needs. We are currently testing that, but it will still take a long time before you also have it at home. Um, Hossein, it was uh, uh, definitely not an easy start, but I think you did a great job and you can be proud of what you have achieved. Um, managing different stakeholders uh, in a dynamic and changing environment made it actually uh, quite challenging. I appreciated that throughout the process, uh, and that was not always uh, easy or uh, to be expected, you all the time remain professional and with a very constructive attitude. Um, Hossein, it was a, a very pleasure to work with you and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Now I would like to call forward Mrs. Mir Mircha Fay and Mr. Trompert. Parima, there we are finally. So as you all know, at Philips we are striving to world, make the world healthier and more sustainable um, through innovation with the goal of improving the lives of 2.5 billion people a year by 2030. A very impressive statement that requires smart people to deliver on this ambitious start. This huge ambition, uh, uh, this huge, huge ambition has to deliver quality healthcare for all at all ages, and at the same time minimizing the environmental impact that we all have on the environment. And that's a huge challenge, because we need more and deliver more care to more people at the same time. To drive this essential transition, we need to have solid insights in our current performance and understand where we can find elements of improvement moving forward. And um, in short, we need, we need to collect the right data, and Parima, you are well aware with the flow that we have processed in the last 10 months. Um, and not only collecting the right data, but also making sure that we clean the data and transform the data that we can get valuable insights to facilitate that very important transition.
and at the same time um, safeguard the quality of the data by implementing the smart controls that we've been working on. And having Excel in place, having the data, sending it around by mail doesn't change a lot. And that's why we need smart people and presenting these, in, in these uh, uh, actionable insights into nice dashboards. I'm not sure how many of you have seen Minority Report with Tom Cruise, but that's the stuff we're aiming for, right? That you open your dashboard in the morning and you instantly see where you put your performance is from an environmental standpoint and instantly also understand what kind of improvements I can take today to improve tomorrow. And it's also why we need smart tools, but the tools are only one part of the aspect. We also need smart people. And that's where you came in, uh, Parima. And that's where we're extremely excited with these 10 months that we have been working together with this with the awesome team, I must say. Close collaboration and also with Dan here in the audience. It was a true pleasure because step by step, we need people like you to make this sustainable transition happen. Making sure that we make the world a better place step by step and making sure that the leadership of Philips understands where we can improve. And that's where we come in, making sure that they see the right data, they see the elements where we can improve, and that we present this to them on a golden platter and they do the rest of the work. It's a team sprint. And that's also why I would love to congratulate you with the magnificent work you have delivered in the past, well, 10 months, to make sure that our logistics streams, which is the most significant part of our operational carbon footprint within our operations, to make sure that we gain those insights and also finding those room for improvements against all the modes of transport. And we are extremely excited to say that you are now part of the Philips family, right? And we're gonna work even harder with the amazing team that we have to deliver more impact and make the world a better place, step by step. Parima, thank you for the last 10 months, and we're gonna make it even more amazing in the coming months while you stay at our team. Congratulations. Then I would like to call forward Mr. O'Hara. Dear Chris, I know you already for quite some years. You draw my attention because you were one of the two students that participated in an experiment where the first half year of the EIT digital embedded system mass program was offered in a fully online setting. This was not an easy journey for both sides. A few years later, I met you as a trainee in our PDN program, and one year later, Janja asked me whether I was willing to supervise a project with Siemens Leuven on a topic on system engineering. And guess who was the trainee? You. I'm actually replacing Jonathan Menu from Siemens, who could not attend here today, and he provided me with a few sentences. The Cogent project addresses one of the primary needs for collaborative assessment of system design, enabling designers to bring data objects together and to access the same objects and tools that allow for managing, tracking, and organizing them. The many faces data object and system architecture can have often require enabling transformation between different data formats. At the same time, the envisioned solution requires a certain degree of flexibility to changing and new third-party tools. The nature of this work, enabling to organize data objects, involves many interfaces to different tooling and process features. Scoping was one of the challenges in this process. It required abstracting from front-end aspects, e.g., for instance, how a user interface organize, organization layer, procedural aspects, for instance, in which order a user prefers to, certain, to use certain tools, as well as the collaborative design support itself. For instance, decision algorithm. What remains is the essence of Cogent itself, the Cogent plugin manager. In conversations with Chris, he was always acting a bit like a hurricane, really intensively talking, trying to involve many different aspects that not necessarily are directly related, 
difficult to bring to a stop and always giving the impression that he was being continuously functioning on a topic for days and days, but also very en energetic and enthusiastic and excellent in independently doing his thing. I always had to ask him for zooming out a bit and bringing me up to speed again, after which we could have very productive conversations. The result of the, his work were very good, uh, were very good and interesting. And of all, and of course, it is great to see you continuing in this uh, space domain. He wishes you the uh, best for the future endeavor. I recognize fully what Jonathan wrote. I remember one of the first meetings we had, where you were pulling in all kinds of AI-related techniques ranging from machine learning to neural networks, and I don't know what else that you would like to pull in. I was baffled, and it took me some minutes to realize that you were over-optimistic about what you could achieve in about 10 months project. So I realized that, I, that to bring this to a good end, my ambition would be to temper you and uh, to make sure that you came up with the good results. After that, our discussions became very inspiring and fruitful. You took my advice to investigate plugin architectures and graph databases. Your work overall was very explorative in nature, and I appreciated that. I know you are working on a paper submission, and I'm looking forward to see the end result of that paper. And you will continue in system engineering. Um, you combine a position at NASA with a PhD position at the University of Tokyo. I don't know how you are going to manage that from both sides of the world, but you will do that, I know for sure. Um, I'm happy to see that you got inspired by research in the area of system engineering, and I sincerely hope that we can cooperate with you in the future. So I want to congratulate you also on behalf of Jonathan. Then I would like to call forward Mrs. Pureth Suren and Mr. Huizing. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Tuvi, you've performed your PDN thesis project at ASML. Maybe you noticed a chip machine manufacturer in Veldhoven. And Sander van der Berg was your supervisor there. But he was not able to come. So I am addressing you as the university supervisor of your project. And note, I'm liberally citing from Sander's information in my speech. At the heart of the chips making machines that are produced by ASML is a laser. This laser lights the silicon wafer, which chips to be, and makes the lithographic process work. Uh, a piece of software called dose control drives the laser to make sure that the right amount of light uh, with the right wavelength and the right bandwidth uh, falls upon the right spot at the right moment. This is, as you hear, a complex piece of software that is all the time improved and updated to new technology and has to be tested, therefore. And to make this process of testing workable, the laser is simulated by some hardware and software system that receives signals from the dose control and sends signals back, behaving just as if it was a laser. And this is where you, Tuvi, enter the picture, because the current simulator has problems. It is not so flexible in their software, and the performance is lacking with the new technology. So replace it. Replace the hardware with something faster and more reliable. Design new software with a more modern structure or architecture, as we are saying. And that would be a high complexity and 
wide diversity project, and that makes it a real challenge. Tuvi, you knowingly accepted this challenge and went to work. You had to learn many new things. For example, the whole ASML dose control simulation environment, the laser simulator hardware, the current laser simulator software, and some very specific dose control domain knowledge. There is so much knowledge packed in this company, and that's why they sell so many of these machines and earn a lot of money with it. On top of that, you had to identify the weak points in the current software design and come with a new design and implementation. In the beginning of the project, I saw you uh, sometimes being a bit overwhelmed with all of this. Nevertheless, you went for it, pestering expert to give you knowledge, dealing with setbacks such as a suddenly and unexpectedly broken Raspberry Pi, that's a computer, finding your system refused by the security system of ASML. Now that is some hurdle to take. Citing Sander van den Berg, Tuvi's eagerness, dedication, proactive attitude and perseverance made her success happen. Not only from a technical perspective, but also from an organizational perspective, you show to be very creative and able to work independently. End of quote. And on top of that, I think you have grown in this project, taking advice on several things and improved, for instance, in your communication skills. You created an initial version of the next generation laser simulator software. The new object-oriented design drastically improved the main ability and other capabilities of the software. And you showed that a good software design in combination with a powerful and reliable platform solved the problems with the current laser simulator. You did a job that impressed us and, more importantly, the people at ASML. And I think this is clearly proven by the fact that you are invited to and will join or have joined the team at ASML. I congratulate you with this result and want to include your family in this. And I wish you a prosperous career. Then I would like to call forward Mr. Raji and Mr. Gramza. Israel. Past 10 months, uh, you've been working for Thermo Fisher, a uh, company which produces microscopes between other products, which are installed and deployed all over the world, serving very different and varying purposes. And uh, we asked you actually to think together with us about a solution that would help our company to understand how the software is executed in the reality in a varying environment. So we have asked uh, Yusril to build a, and design a system that would help to visualize software execution paths. And uh, this is something that uh, helps us from one side to understand better how the software behaves in a real uh, world environment and on the other hand, uh, also to shape the execution architecture of the software in the, in the future. And when we started this assignment, we knew that it is uh, a job with actually open end, uh, or at least some open ends. We didn't have uh, exactly defined requirements. We had ideas. And uh, there was a question, how well you will manage the situation, because it turned out to be something between research project, feasibility study, and uh, work 
on uh, actual, uh, actual software product. And um, you managed all those uh, different and difficult uh, hurdles very well. So uh, you have proven that you can do some research, you can deal with uncertain situations and come up with uh, creative ideas how to, how to overcome them. So uh, in this sense, I am very happy to, to, to have you with us and helping, uh, helping realizing this, uh, this idea. And uh, you also demonstrated uh, not only that, but also uh, professional skills. Project managed by you was uh, done very well. Uh, uh, reports and quality of them was only growing uh, during the uh, during the project, and the final presentation was really really impressive. And yes, today your study comes to the end. You start, uh, I know, your professional career very soon. So uh, let me congratulate you and wish you all the best in your, in the future. Then I would like to call forward Mr. Roma Bart, Mr. De Vlieg is not here, but will address you online. Louis, first of all, my congratulations with your graduation and getting your PDA diploma today. And also my congratulations to Christina, your family and your friends. Unfortunately, I cannot be here today, but hopefully this video is a little bit of a substitute. Supervising you was a real pleasure. You built bridges between scientific disciplines, but also between people. Your project was part, is part of Imagine. And Imagine is an interdisciplinary scientific program in which Wageningen University, Utrecht University, Eindhoven, several companies, several organizations are working together with the task to improve health and welfare of farm animals and to develop innovative solutions for producing food in a sustainable way. Win. You are a very pragmatic and problem-solving PDE uh, student. Uh, the postmaster uh, PDE programs were initiated by the Dutch high-tech industry because they need professionals that can design and develop innovative solutions for very complex problems. And that is exactly what you did in the last year. You developed new data science solutions to translate huge amounts of computer vision data, of animal behavior, to get new scientific insights. And we hope that this first step in Imagine can help us to develop artificial intelligence systems to automatically identify which animals are genetically the most suitable to live peacefully in large groups, the so-called super social animals. You also gave an excellent public defense presentation. And there was a lot of interest, more than 43 attendees and we got a lot of positive feedback. For example, from Bas Rodenburg, professor in animal welfare at the Utrecht University. He wrote, Lewis made a very useful contribution to the project by already thinking about useful sensor patterns. I know you still have to make a choice regarding your next step in the career. And I wish you all the wisdom to make the right choice. But anyway, I hope 
we stay in touch. I cannot hand out the diploma in this moment, but Jan Jan can. Not only in her role as program director of the PDN Software Technology Program, but also because she was scientifically closely involved in your project. Jan Jan, can you please take over and hand out the <laughs> diploma to Louis? Thank you very much and bye bye. Then I would like to call forward Mr. Rom R Romashov and Mrs. Chu. Vladimir, it is amazing to meet finally face to face during your graduation. And it, it is a pleasure to be here, and it has been an honor to be your uh, supervisor during the couple, past couple of months. As you know, financial institutions worldwide are facing a couple of challenges. Amongst others, regulatory compliance or challenges bank taking part, taking uh, some of our market share. With regards to solving these challenges, data play an important role. Um, as you know, Rabobank has defined a data strategy, a data roadmap, um, as, well as, as well as a target architecture with, related to data. In order to be able to realize this enterprise-wide uh, objective, every domain needs to um, yeah, take a part, and we need to be able to deliver complete and accurate data. And that, that is where you step in and help us uh, uh, a step forward. At the beginning of this year, Vladimir, you joined us in the corporate banking domain, where you start working on an end-to-end -end process and data flow for our, um, for our digital working capital business. The core component that you have been working on is named Digital Working Capital. It is a um, it is a application that interacts. Uh, um, it is a client-facing portal as well as uh, uh, a applications that cater for the primary processes within Rabobank. And um, it has multiple interactions within other domains in the bank. The fact that this is a key component for a specific, specific business, as well as this platform interacts with different applications in the enterprise, gives away the complexity of your project. The complexity not only from a content perspective, which you did very well, but also the complexity in managing a diverse group of stakeholders, IT, business, and architecture, cross-domain. You did a great job in there. And on top of that, um, the department that you have joined was in scope of a, a reorganization, a, a organizational restructuring. And none of that holds you back, and uh, you persevered. And I admire your grit and perseverance in this. Uh, as an end result, you delivered a working um, demo uh, a proof of concept in which you showed that ch the choices we made uh, were, were correct and the team could continue working on the design that you have helped us with. On behalf of Rabobank and on behalf of the Digital Working Capital team, I would like to thank you for the work and congratulations with your diploma. Then I would like to call forward Mr. Roth.
And Niels, you will also be addressed online by Jacob de Vlieg. Hi, Niels. Congratulations with your PDN diploma. And also my congratulations to your family and friends. You have now the title of professional doctorate in engineering. Scientists, engineers, designers that can work with very advanced technology and science to solve very complex problems, real life problems. You worked in the Internet of Food project. And that project is part of the Sustainable Food Initiative, SFI. And in SFI, several companies like Unilever and Samurai's and Knowledge Institute, Utrecht University, Wageningen, Eindhoven, NISO, teamed up to develop innovative solutions to produce food in a sustainable way at the lowest environmental footprint, despite climate change, energy issues, uh, growing world populations, and so on. And in the Internet of Food project, you developed digital solutions to share complex food models, proprietary food models, but without giving the IP away. IP stands for intellectual property. This can save a lot of costs because developing a food model is extremely expensive. By combining existing knowledge between the companies, you can speed up innovation. More or less make one plus one three. And that is what your technology can do and what your science can do. You're a very modest scientist. But you did a great job. For instance, you combined connected ontology expertise and software engineering methodologies to make it all happen. And you did that in a very smart way. In November, you will give demonstrations together with scientists from Wageningen and from JATS, Euromia's Academy of Data Science, to show how your work, your solutions are working in practice. Unfortunately, I cannot hand out the diploma uh, in person today, but Janja will do this. Not only in her role as a director PDN software technology, but also because she was involved in your project as well, in also stimulating agri-food tech, eh, the crossovers between agri-food and high-tech in all its manifestations to produce sustainable food in the coming years. Enjoy the rest of the session. I hope we keep in touch. Janja, can I ask you again to help me a little bit and hand over the diploma to Niels? Hey, thank you very much, and I hope to see you all again soon in Eindhoven. Bye bye. Then I would like to call forward Ms. Sadiji and Mr. Sheng. Finally, the big day has come, the big day of your graduation. I still remember about a year ago, exactly a year ago, uh, I had an interview with you, and uh, it was uh, pretty clear after a few rounds of interview, you are the person uh, we want and we need. Um, but after making the decision, I had the two doubts in my mind. 
The first one is that it was, uh, as you all know, a special period where everybody has to work from home. I was not confident that we can provide a very good uh, uh, mentorship to you remotely, and it wouldn't be fair for the trainees if we did a, if we did a poor job. A second uh, doubt is that before we start in this project, someone told me that this is gonna take two or three main years of very valuable ASML resource to find out the proper solution. I didn't believe this guy, but uh, I also didn't tell you that uh, this was uh, going to be very challenging. Um, but about 10 months ago, you, uh, you, you started to work on this project. Uh, during the whole project, you have been working really hard. You are a very hardworking lady. If I remember correctly, this is also the last uh, uh, st sentence you told me during the interview. And you, uh, yeah, you didn't tell lies about that. Uh, all the ways you have been very easy to communicate, you are very easy to uh, collaborate with, but you have a very strong drive to deliver the best result. You act very proactively, and uh, you're actively trying to reach the person and get relevant information. In a complex uh, company like ASML, this is going to help you uh, a long way. Uh, you worked very independently. This is also due to the COVID situation, but you stayed very communicative. Um, you were not trained to work in a pattern recognition image uh, processing domain, but in the end, uh, you have become the, quite an expert. I can certainly say that you are more expert in this area than I am. Um, in the end, you delivered a really good result. You constructed a uh, replacement for the for Coconex uh, uh, library. It's uh, a pattern recognition tool used for our wave alignment uh, for Yistar machine. It shows the potential to reduce the cost for for Yistars. Uh, to be exact, it's about uh, 3.5 thousand per each machine, and we have uh, 600 machines in the field. It is also delivering good uh, performance. Uh, in terms of both accuracy and uh, throughput, so which is really great. So it went way beyond just the feasibility uh, study. You also delivered the tool into our uh, quali qualified uh, baseline. I think that's also a very good achievement. In fact, we are so happy with uh, your result. We already wanted to hire you two months ago, but we had to wait, and uh, that's okay. Um, I'm very happy for you that your family can join in this very special occasion of yours. Um, I'm also very glad to hear that you have uh, taken some holidays because uh, this will be uh, uh, certainly helpful uh, before you go into the next challenge within ASML. Um, I'm looking forward to work with you um, and uh, I'm really honored to present this uh, diploma to you and uh, you graduated as a uh, cum laude, if I remember correctly. Okay. I would like to call, call forward Mr. Chokri and Mr. Verbeten. Yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm replacing um, uh, Johan Grille, who was your uh, daily uh, technical uh, coach. Uh, the title of your uh, thesis is uh, Monitoring as a Service, uh, also known as MAS. And Monitoring as a Service is one of the many cloud computing delivery uh, models, a framework to um, uh, facilitate the deployment of monitoring functionalities for various applications within the cloud. And Akram was working at Metrology and Machine Control Cluster, which is a software engineering uh, cluster in the uh, DNE organization at ASML. And uh, this cluster does have a serious growth challenge 
We all can read in the newspapers that there is a shortage of uh, computer chips. And in order to meet this um, rapid increasing the demand, the software deliveries must become much faster and uh, delivered with the highest quality level. To become faster, we use the so-called value stream analysis uh, to identify uh, software development activities with long lead times. One by one opportunities to improve the speed. How nice would it be when every development team has their own dashboard to do their value stream analysis and improve the efficiency in a distributed way? One of Akram's biggest challenges at the start of the project was the huge amount of interest in this mass project. Akram had to pitch uh, the project multiple times in different teams, different departments across the d and organization. And um, many development teams already had ideas, hundreds of KPIs, metrics that should be measured. With your brave attitude, uh, you, work, uh, you took up the challenge to align with all the stakeholders and drive the definition of those metrics and key indicators to a closure. It was an impressive result. Creating the first prototype of the dashboard, gathering all the data was not a problem for Akram. Our first automated value stream analysis was born. Next to the initial dashboard, you also implemented another example of a dashboard with different data sources, which inspired development teams to start using the dashboards and also to um, start creating their own dashboards. Together with the user documentation and also the validation of your user design processes, you completed your assignment in a very successful way. The final mass product we will, uh, will be extended and maintained by the Innovation Hub team. And uh, the development teams continue to improve their software deliveries by using your, uh, your uh, mass products. Thanks a lot, also on behalf of the Innovation Hub team members, and I'm more than happy that you continue your career at ESMA. Congratulations. And finally, I would like to call forward Mr. Franke and Mr. Geisbergs. So, Tom, here we are. Maybe a quick introduction. My name is Eric. I'm one of the two mentors uh, from Tom at Philips. Actually, I'm here also on behalf of my colleague uh, Herwig, uh, who should have been speaking here today. But uh, unfortunately, he fell ill. Um, so my journey with, uh, with you, Tom, started 10, years, 10 months ago in the midst of the pandemic. And it, uh, yeah, it took a while before we actually uh, met in person. Um, 10 months ago, Tom, Herwig and I started discussing options for an interesting thesis subject. And actually, from the start, Tom, you took the lead in investigating the ideas which, uh, with various stakeholders in Phillips. And at a certain moment, you came back with the word health suite. The word health suite popped up. And maybe for the audience, as you may have heard, health suite is a Philips cloud-based offering to address healthcare famous quadruple aim, being improved patient and consumer experience, better health outcome, improved staff satisfaction, and lower cost of care. Essentially, Health, health Suite allows us to rethink healthcare at scale and leveraging digitization, data insights, and enabling virtual care. A key strength of Health Suite is being able to easily run healthcare software securely and fully compliant in a, helper, in a hybrid cloud. The contribution you made, Tom, has been significant in bringing Health Suite to its next level. The secure omnidirectional communications relay design you created is for Philips a valuable asset enabling to run complex and combined workloads. 
not only from on-premise and in cloud, but also between different healthcare organizations in a bi-directional, secure and regulate, regulated way, and with low development and operational effort. The solution is rock solid, secure, and can operate in many local regulated environments. And customers can still, are still in control. They can monitor, look over the shoulder, and intervene if they want to. Tom, you and I discussed this before, but the way you did this is truly remarkable. You managed to activate internal Philips teams through good stakeholder management. Not only did you produce an elegant and straightforward design, but you also did this by building on existing Philips platform and software assets. And last but not least, it really all worked. It's really good. Dear audience, do not underestimate the significance of what I just mentioned. It is not so difficult to develop a software solution, but it is really hard to keep it simple and comply with all the security policies and design constraints. And you all did that, Tom. Therefore, Tom, on behalf of myself, Herwig and all the Philips colleagues you worked with, and particularly also Joost Reusel and Erik Poelke, where you had some really cool uh, evening and jam sessions with, we all want to thank you for your hard work, your creativity, your cur curiosity, your knowledge, and above all, your spirit to team up and win. So thank you very much, Tom, and congratulations. Dear graduates, first of all, congratulations with your graduation. From now on, you may use the degree prof Professional Doctorate in Engineering or PDN. The scientific degree of PDN involves duties as well as rights. As a holder of this degree, you are committed to standards of scientific integrity, trustworthiness, intellectual honesty, openness, independence, and societal responsibility. These standards are described in more detail in the Netherlands Code of Conduct for Research Integrity and the Eindhoven Code based on it. You also have duties towards society. You must be clear about the boundaries of your own expertise and you must communicate honestly and independently about the results of your work, including potential risks associated with it. You are committed to the ethical codes of research and design involving human subjects or animals. These are sincere words, and I hope that you will remember them in the future. We wish you all the best and a promising career in industry High-tech companies are in great need of technological designers with the skills you have acquired over the last two years. Hence, the opportunities that lay ahead will be endless. To conclude this ceremony, here are a few directions for the closure of this ceremony. First of all, the speakers, graduates, and the TUE supervisors present here, we'll leave the blower zaal at the auditorium side, that side, to have a picture taken as a group. Once the speakers, graduates, and their TUE supervisors have left the blower zaal, you, the audience, may exit to the Voorhof, where drinks are being served. The speakers and TUE supervisors will have the opportunity to congratulate the graduates at the reception. And hereby, I close this meeting.